Can we start, Nadia? Green light, okay. Very good. So, okay, good morning and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, participating uh, in, the, in this international final conference of uh, the WIN project. WIN in our case means uh, Women Traffic Integration. I'm Valeria Quartola, project coordinator of uh, the Fondo Provinciale Milanese per la Cooperazione Internazionale, that is uh, an Italian association of around 20 local authorities of the province of Milano, Italy, uh, that is uh, the lead partner of the WIM project. To start, uh, I would like to, to remind you a few rules uh, that we, we, we kindly ask you to respect during the event. So please uh, rename yourself, entering your name and surname uh, and the name of your organization. During the meeting, only panelists and the moderator can, are, are visible in the, on, on, with their camera on. If you have any questions, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon of Zoom or write directly your question on the chat. During the discussion, also people asking questions uh, will be allowed to switch on their camera and the microphone. The meeting is recorded, and but if you don't want to be recorded, please just do not uh, switch on your, your camera, you're welcome. So now uh, I would like immediately to give the floor to uh, the president of Fondo Provinciale Milanese, Honorevole Claudio D'Amico, uh, for a welcome speech. Good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to me be here today because uh, this is the end of uh, a long, uh, a long uh, project that uh, took uh, our uh, our time, our concentration for uh, uh, two years, and now we are uh, at the end of uh, of this. Uh, important uh, project uh, my my organization is uh, uh, the fondo provinciale milanese per la cooperazione internazionale uh, this is uh, um, an association of uh, public entities public cities and uh, you know we are uh, uh, representing in this case, in this WIN project, all the other partners, but uh, we didn't uh, work direct with the people that we help. So we had the, the lead, how can I say, of the project, but it was uh, our partners that uh, improved the project. So that's why uh, at the beginning of this meeting, I would like to thank you uh, for your work. I would like to, to explain to everyone who's listened to us. Uh, I don't know how many people is listen to us, if it's open to all the public now or just uh, to people that work on, on that. Maybe, maybe someone can explain me. Uh, how many people is uh, is connected later? Uh, but uh, I would like to thank a lot all of you. Thank you very much because with your uh, work we did something important. We did something that uh, probably uh, will change the life of. Uh, certain number of uh, women and uh, this is uh, something that will uh, remain in our uh, in our soul because uh, when you help someone that need help uh, it's something that will remain in your soul we have uh, a lot of people that uh, are victim of uh, smugglers that bring them to europe and they they use them as a, as a 
how to say, victim of uh, those organizations and uh, help those women to save their, their, their life and uh, propose a new, new way, new life, a new um, horizon to them. I think it's very, very, very important. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, we need to go on with this kind of project kind of projects are uh, uh, fundamental for uh, try to stop the, the smugglers uh, because if you uh, if you uh, block the, the way they, they use uh, this um, illegal uh, uh, migration to to their badly interest, I think it would be the, the way to start to start the way to, to start a new a new approach in uh, in in this field, a new approach that should be devoted to the, the, the human being and uh, should be open, should open our uh, soul to who need to be. So thank you. This is, uh, you know, when you arrive at the end of a, of a road, uh, you have to look back and uh, and uh, and you have to think how was the world before our our uh, hard work it was uh, worse or it was better i think the world before us before this project was uh, worse now the world is better because we had 45 women to to save their life and uh, and uh, start start something new, uh, at least try to and give them uh, the possibility to change uh, their life. So I think the, the world is better with, uh, with us and uh, this project should be recognized as uh, an important project and as something that should remain in the, in the, in the book of history. So thank you a lot again to all of you. And now I, I want to give the floor to, to the partners that they improve the project, who works uh, on, with, with the women, with the women uh, who was in contact, direct contact with them. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, you can tell us uh, a lot more. Uh, my introduction, so it, it is ended now, and uh, uh, I will uh, I will listen. I will listen uh, your uh, your um, speech because uh, you will bring uh, uh, the reality of the things. You will uh, tell us how hard was work with them, how was the which have been the the difficulties the problems that you have to solve. And uh, so thank you very much again. And the floor is in you. Thank you very much, Reverend Amico, for your speech. So now uh, I would like to, to present uh, the WIM project with the support of uh, a short PowerPoint presentation. Uh, after this introduction, we will uh, have a first. We will have first a panel discussion, and then the presentation of the document for the capitalization of the project results. At the end of the conference, we will send you a quick survey to evaluate your level of satisfaction. Now we go on with the presentation of the project. I 
uh, I'll share my screen. Okay. So. Okay. So the <clears throat> the Win project is a, a two years project, two year project funded by the European Commission, the European Union Asylum Migration and Integration Fund. It started on October two thousand and nineteen and it will end at the beginning of November. The project is promoted by five organizations working in Italy, Spain, and Bulgaria that are actually the, the country's target of the action. We have three organizations from Italy, one for Spain, from Spanish, for Spain, sorry, and one from Bulgaria. From Italy, we have Fondo Provinciale Milanese per la Cooperazione Internazionale, Cooperativa Ulule, Energia e Impresa Sociale. From Spain, we have Association Amiga and Animus Association. Uh, I would like, if possible, to ask my colleague to present their self and their, organi their organization, uh, starting from, and I, stop the sharing maybe uh, starting from martina giorgetti from lule good morning everyone um i start with a brief presentation of our cooperativa lule lule that means flower in albanian is an initiative founded in 1996 in abbiate a city in the southwest of milano by a group of volunteers uh, with the aim of uh, helping victims of trafficking for sexual uh, exploitation in 20 years the scope of the intervention of Lule uh, has been greatly expanded also thanks to the birth in 2001 of Cooperativa Lule. Currently, uh, Lule carries out in seven provinces in the uh, Lombard region and in uh, the southwest area of Milano actions in favor of uh, social integration of people at risk of exclusion through uh, various activities oriented to their personal autonomy. Currently, Lule offers uh, street contact activities with, with uh, prostitutes uh, aimed uh, at uh, health protection, building uh, relationships with them uh, and promoting their autonomy. Um, activities uh, of uh, telephone and flat contact with prostitutes aimed uh, as well as health protection and uh, building meaningful relationships. Activities uh, uh, of prompt reception to guarantee immediate protection, taking charge uh, and territorial integration activities uh, to promote uh, integration of people um, included in social um, protection path, guidance, counseling and referral activities through the connection with the National Anti-Trafficking Helpline and uh, communication and training activities to inform uh, and raise uh, awareness on the territory and to train volunteers and uh, operators. Activities in the area of trafficking and uh, exploitation are carried out by um, around 35 uh, trained volunteers and uh, 25 uh, professional collaborators, such as uh, uh, cultural mediators, uh, educators, uh, uh, psychologists, and uh, social workers. In these uh, recent years, uh, in uh, all uh, its projects, uh, Lule have helped uh, around 2,000 women uh, victim, women with victims of trafficking and violence, uh, 5,000 Italian and foreign uh, minors, and 15,000 adults in fragile situations due to their um, migratory um, due to their um, migration experiences or uh, labor exploitation. Uh, finally, we would like to point out that uh, Cooperativa Lule pays uh, a great attention to the routine of its initiative in um, these community policies in a constant dialogue with territories and with its citizens on these uh, issues that we are addressing. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Uh, now, uh, Energe Giulia Spano, project manager from Energeia, if you want to present yourself and uh, the organization. Thank you, Valeria. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Giulia, and I will represent Energeia Impresa Sociale as a project manager of the WIND project. Energeia is an official training and employment services provider operating in Italy at regional level in the Lombardy region. Among its different activities, Energeia carry out specific projects aimed at supporting the socioeconomic integration of more vulnerable, vulnerable people at risk of marginalization, including asylum seekers and refugees, victims of trafficking, but also people with disability and inmates. Thank you. Thank you, Giulia. Uh, Virgin, Virginia from uh, oh, Vanessa from uh, um, Amiga. Vanessa, are you okay. speaking? No. Yes, it's going to be okay. me. It's going to be me. Thank you very much. Vanessa. Vanessa. Okay, uh, the Association Amiga por los Derechos Humanos de las Mujeres is a non-profit organization launched in 2010 to work with women and especially with migrant women victim of, uh, victims of gender-based vi based violence as it is defined by the international human rights framework. Because as many of you probably know, the Spanish legislation has a very restrictive definition of gender-based violence limited to the intimate partner violence against women. For this reason, and taking into consideration an intersectional perspective of gender-based violence, the Asociación Amiga was born to work with migrant women on the prevention and action against the violation of sexual and reproductive rights, intimate partner violence, labor discrimination and exploitation, sexual harassment, and sexual exploitation and trafficking. Regarding the last issue, our association was one of the first lay organizations working with sexually exploited women. As many of the entities implementing activities in this area were religious organizations that started their work with vulnerable women and specifically with prostituted women even more than 40 years ago. Uh, the Asociación Amiga has its main office in Seville and works with the, uh, in the assistance of traffic women with an abolitionist perspective and provides interdisciplinary assistance to women, especially in the south of Spain. In this sense, we are also one of the first lay organizations providing free, providing free legal aid uh, or free legal assistance to the victims of trafficking. Amiga is part of the network of organizations working against trafficking in Andalusia that is called Antena Sur Contra la Trata. And through this pla platform is also part of the Spanish network against trafficking that is called the Red Española Contra la Trata de Seres Humanos. Um, we also provide assistance for young women victims of intimate partner violence through an agreement signed with the public university Pablo Dolavide in Seville and work activity against sexual harassment and pri in private and public spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, okay, to, to finish, I would like Nadia uh, to uh, Nadia Kutsuarova. Uh, from Animus Association to present yourself and organization. Thank you. I'm Nadia Kuzuharuva. I'm the project manager uh, within WIND projects for uh, Bulgaria, for the activities implemented in Bulgaria. Uh, they are implemented by Animus Associ Association Foundation, which is an uh, organization uh, existing already more than 25 years. Our core activities are the provision of direct support to victims of violence. We don't work only with trafficked persons, but also with victims of domestic violence, sexual violence, and, uh, and children victims of uh, violence. We're also active in the field uh, of um, advocacy and prevention. And concerning uh, trafficking, I can say that we are a member of the EU Anti-Trafficking Civil Society Platform and the La Strada and International NGO Platform. Uh, the main services that we provide is a crisis center, helpline, a uh, variety of uh, psychological and uh, social support services for, for the victims. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. 
Thank you, all of you. Um, I would uh, go on with, uh, with my presentation. So I will share again the screen. Okay. So which is uh, the Win Project main objective? It is improving the social economic integration of uh, 45 third country women victims of uh, trafficking of human beings for the purpose of sexual exploitation in Italy, Spain, and Bulgaria, thus contributing to the prevention of their trafficking. We try to contribute uh, the achievement of this objective through these uh, uh, main activities. Uh, at the beginning of the project, uh, a partner's mutual learning workshop and definition of common guidelines, including tools and the methodologies to carry out the activities in the three countries. Identification of 45 women, assessment of their skill and their needs. Definition, implementation, and continuous monitoring of personal integration plan plans based on the skill balance and on the individual needs by offering this activity, these services, training services, employment services, social, legal, educational, psychological, and cultural linguistic mediation services. Then we have we had raising awareness activities throughout the project, uh, raising awareness activity uh, focus on uh, uh, trafficking of human beings, address to business community, training and job placement service providers, trade unions, and the professional organizations. Creation and dissemination of the video shifting that is part of our raising awareness campaign, supporting the uh, social economic integration of women's uh, victims of trafficking, and uh, drafting and dissemination of uh, a document for the capitalization of the results that we will, uh, uh, will, uh, will speak about uh, this document at, uh, in the second, in the third session of uh, uh, the meeting and the final evaluation of the project. Okay, now I, I would like to, I think it's, it's nice to, before going on with the panel discussion, I would like to start more emotionally uh, showing the video shifting uh, that uh, has been, is, okay, as I said, is part of our Raising Awareness campaign and uh, has been created thanks to the WIM project and uh, uh, by the video uh, production company called uh, uh, Blinkfish. Uh, it is based on uh, real stories and uh, um, on real stories in the three countries of the project, target of the project, and uh, on the work of the WIM partners. Um, I, I would ask Nadia, who is uh, sharing the screen. Okay, thank you. اجيت على اوروبا حتى الحق بابن عمي كنت كثير معلقه امال بحياه جديده ايما هيب مي جو ايطالي تو دو بيبي سيتا لو امابا استاوا كونفينسيدا كي ال ار ال امور دي مي فيدا بعد سنه من العرس اكتشفت انه جوزي عنده عيله ثانيه مع الوقت صار يجيب رجال على البيت يجبرني نام معهم مقابل مصاري I need to start working to pay the money, give the, the woman. Descubrí que me había vendido. Fui esclava durante cinco años. بواحدة من الليالي ابني كان مريض. خطر لي إني هرب من البيت. Thank God, say. Some people, if they help people, will be victim. 
La mia famiglia mi ha sempre insegnato a riconoscere i miei privilegi. Solo oggi mi sono resa conto di ciò che davvero i miei genitori volevano insegnarmi. Decidi che quería studiare e llegar a ser trabajadora social. Un día conocí a Nadia. Ella me devolvió la libertad. Me encontró trabajo, me ayudó a denunciar lo que me había sucedido. Cuando conocí a Paloma, entendí qué significa ser un apoyo para alguien. Atipa te fahamu wata hay wotasalu bil khadamat al ijtimaahi. Bi wata hasset eno min al mumkin inqazi. Sreshnah edin isklutchitelen chubek, koyto mi predloji da mu pomagam va frizjokski salon. Sega as iskam da napkave sushtuto za Leila. My name is Stella. It's me, Leila. My name is Paloma. Laura. This is Suavo. Nadia. I reconozco how the life is made of encounters. People, they tell me that I'm very fragile. Some people can ruin your life, others can help you rebuild it. I know that I'm very strong. Today, I have a job and I know what I'm going to learn. Slowly, slowly, I'm going to be free. 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 Thank you. So, okay, I I don't know how how you find I found it, but I find, I find every time I find it very uh, touching. Um, the I hope that this video created a nice mood to go on with the with the next session with the panel discussion. Um, Nadia, I I would leave the the word to to you. Uh, Nadia Kozorova uh, will moderate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank so, you, Valeria. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, I think this video shows that, uh, yes, we, we discuss a lot. We create policies and practices and guides and everything. But when it comes to the real life of people, it's, uh, it's, it's different. And uh, sometimes it's not easy, but uh, if we are optimistic and we, if we understand each other, nevertheless, we all speak different languages, uh, we, can, we can help people. Um, I would like um, first to uh, shortly remind uh, how this uh, panel discussion will happen. The panel discussion will happen in two parts. Uh, with short break in, in between. Uh, at the beginning, we will have two of our uh, guests and after we will have the possibilities to um, discuss with them and to uh, ask uh, questions. And then um, in the second part, we will have uh, another three of our distinguished uh, speakers and we will be able to discuss also with them and uh, ask uh, uh, our questions. Um, quest, uh, all of the guests will be with uh, switch cameras, but uh, those of you who would like to uh, give a question, then you should uh, give us a sign with this small hand <laughs> at the bottom of your screens, or you can write your questions uh, in the chat. But honestly, we all prefer to see you and to see your voice. <laughs> Uh, it's your choice, but it will be nice to see each other and to can compensate as much as possible the fact that we are uh, not in the same room and we all have to follow the new pandemic uh, rules and uh, obey the new rules. Okay, uh, first uh, I would like uh, to um, introduce to you uh, our first guest. This is uh, Miss Antoinette Vasileva. 
She is uh, the first vice president of the group of experts on action against trafficking in human beings, Greta, you know, which is the monitoring mechanism of the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. She is a human rights and anti-trafficking expert with uh, more than 18 years of expertise, both in civil and in state sectors. Uh, for nine years, she was the secretary general of the Bulgarian National Commission for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings. But before that and after, she has a broad experience in working with uh, non-governmental organizations. Among them is Animals Association, La Strada Bulgaria, and also the Bulgarian Safer Internet uh, Center. She is expert not only uh, on uh, trafficking in human beings, but also on international development, national policies, children and uh, women's rights, gender-based uh, violence. And now, Antoinette, I give the floor to you to share your thoughts and ideas about uh, what it means to work with uh, vulnerable women from third countries from the European perspective. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, dear all, after this very emotional uh, video that we saw, I would like to congratulate the WIN Consortium for the successful implementation of the WIN project and for focusing on such important topic as uh, labor exploitation of women, victims of trafficking from third countries especially. I would like also to express my gratitude uh, for the opportunity to share Greta's view uh, and overall experience throughout uh, the 47 of 48 state parties to the Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. Um, The fact uh, that COVID-19 pandemic uh, is having a worrying impact on human trafficking across Europe was uh, basically noticed by Greta Group at very early stage uh, of, the, um, uh, of, the, of the pandemic. Frontline uh, NGOs uh, have reported delays in people's being formally identified and um, uh, as victims of trafficking and uh, which seriously affected uh, their access to safe accommodation, healthcare and much needed support and moreover putting them at risk of being uh, further abused. Uh, this is why in our statement from April 2020, Greta urged state parties uh, to do more to prevent the crime, to identify and to support victims as the effects of the pandemic have made them more vulnerable than ever. Uh, throughout the years, uh, Greta paid particular attention uh, to the interface between uh, trafficking in human beings and asylum and the issue related to the identification, protection and support of victims of trafficking amongst uh, um, asylum seekers, refugees and migrants. Since the second evaluation round, uh, Greta country reports have examined in details the measure taken by state parties to combat human trafficking in the context of the unprecedented surge of asylum application in Europe. In June 2020, Greta issued a guidance note on entitlement of victims of trafficking and persons at risk of being trafficked to international protection and uh, with uh, the aim to support state parties to further strengthen the implementation of the obligation to provide international protection to victims of trafficking. The COVID-19 pandemic posed additional challenges to the identification of and support of victims of trafficking, especially amongst asylum seekers and third country nationals. Due to limited capacity of law enforcement and services, victims of trafficking found themselves in an even more vulnerable position. In some countries, the access of UNHCR specialized NGOs and lawyers uh, to asylum reception centers and immigration detention centers has been limited 
or stopped altogether. Meanwhile, traffickers had made the most of the, the situation, increasing the abuse of the vulnerabilities and people of people and exploiting the precocious financial situation of many of their victims. Furthermore, while the authorities reported increased sexual exploitation and criminal activities online, stretch resources and delays in justice systems had been hampering efforts to bring traffickers to account and to provide justice and compensation to their victims. In 2020 annual report, Greta provide, provided a number of examples of how the pandemic is affecting the measures to, to tackle human trafficking in specific countries. In Germany, following a decision to temporarily close brothels and other businesses uh, involving prostitution throughout the country, there has been an increase of hidden prostitution accompanied by more exploitative conditions and violence. In Spain and other countries, perpetrators are increasingly using digital platforms such as Airbnb to rent apartments where sexual exploitation takes place, which reduce the ability of law enforcement agencies and NGOs to detect victims. In Malta, after the first case of COVID-19 were detected amongst uh, asylum seekers, all asylum reception centers and immigration detention centers were closed, preventing UNHCR and NGOs from visiting and providing information, support, and legal system assistance. There have been also reports about hindered access to services such as shelters and healthcare, thus increasing the likelihood of re traumatization and re-victimization. The pandemic has led to particular to a disruption of victims' assistance, support services provided by NGOs, and worsened the possibilities of labor integration of victims. Another vulnerability appears from the fact that many countries do not allow access to the labor market to asylum seekers, all allow only restricted access. In the United Kingdom, asylum seekers are not generally allowed to do paid work, with the exception of those who are given permission to enter employment when their claim has been outstanding for a year. In Ireland, asylum seekers, including trafficked persons seeking asylum, were excluded from accessing the labor market until a Supreme Court decision delivered in 2017 found that such absolute prohibition was contrary to the constitutional right to seek employment. Many country schemes for accessing the labor market have high requirements and make access for victims limited in practice. The scheme of self-employment has apparently led some women, asylum seekers, being driven into working in prostitution on a self-employment basis. While a lack of practical support uh, with regards to accommodation and other living conditions may increase the vulnerability of asylum seekers to being trafficked, measure to integrate, uh, integrate them into the labor market may reduce that vulnerability. In Italy, the project Insight promoted social and labor integration of beneficiaries of international protection accommodated in the asylum reception center. In Estonia, the authorities are implementing the strategy of integration and social cohesion through which the integration of refugees and asylum seekers is supported. Malta has a scheme that allows rejected asylum seekers who have been in Malta for more than five years and who cannot return to their home state to obtain two years renewable residence permit, which should lessen the vulnerability of being trafficked. Access to employment may reduce the isolation of some asylum seekers and enable them to support themselves. It can also avoid create, creating situations where trafficked persons seeking asylum may accept offers of inform, informal employment, which in fact may be recruitment for exploitation. Greta considers that asylum seekers and trafficked persons among asylum seekers should be allowed effective access to labor market. In Portugal and Sweden, asylum seekers can access the labor market immediately after they claim is registered in the authorities. In Italy, the asylum seekers can take up employment after 60 days from the date of launching their asylum application. As noted in Greta Guidance note on preventing and combating human trafficking for the purpose of uh, labor exploitation issued in December 2020, states should provide in cooperation with other relevant, uh, relevant actors, including NGOs and trade unions, assistance to traffic persons with a view to their reintegration and rehabilitation, including in the job market. Vocational training job counseling and job placement schemes, in particular when based on assessment of the overall labor market that include 
include appropriate and safe work opportunities in a wide range of fields. These are the tools of economic empowerment that states should deploy to assist traffic victims in their reintegration. An increased involvement of state employment agencies and private sector, together with increased sensitization of employers with respect to the phenomenon of human trafficking can increase the effectiveness of reintegration. Article 12, paragraph four of the convention required state parties to enable victims of trafficking who are lawful present in the country to have access to the labor market, vocational training and education. This is an important element of recovery and successful social integration of trafficked person is their economic empowerment, which can be achieved through job placement, micro businesses and social enterprises. Greta has stressed the need to develop public private partnership with the view to create a, uh, creating appropriate work and opportunities for victim of trafficking. Uh, there's some really good examples uh, throughout the state parties uh, to the convention, which may inspire and be ground example for governments to build up strong and effective policies on labor integration, a victim of trafficking. Uh, the UK business um, uh, against labor reform made up uh, of 13 uh, multinational business uh, committed to, businesses committed to tackle modern slavery in their own sectors and beyond with programs such as uh, Co-Pride Future providing employment opportunities to survivors. Further, CNS Bank provides bank accounts to survivors who do not possess the necessary documentation required under banking regulations to open an account, something very important. Maltese authorities issued 106 work permits to victims of trafficking between 2019 and 2020. Furthermore, a victim may be granted more than one permit in the same year in order to change job. The State Employment Agency in Malta, as many other countries, hold courses aimed at helping the registered, registered employed persons acquire skills to enhance their employability. In Romania, the National Agency for Employment under the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection has a program that includes three-year agreement with the victims of trafficking and subsidize employers who hire them. In conclusion, why integration and reintegration into the labor market is important for victims of human trafficking? Why victim needs education and employment support by the authorities to break the vicious circle of exploitation? Because having work, it gives them the feeling they are in control of their life. Because it provides safety that they can work it out on their own with the time being. Because it gives them hope for future, any future, without abuse and exploitation. Because it could be a life-changing experience for them. I wish we could have a survivor of human trafficking in this conference today and to hear from her or him, her or his experience and challenges in acquisition of qualification, finding job, and moreover, stay long enough at a given job. Because what many, including politicians, take for granted, victims fight fights for fiercely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antoinette, for your optimistic speech, because you gave us so uh, many good examples uh, and uh, of uh, uh, good practices, which is one of the idea of this meeting to uh, learn about uh, positive experience um, around uh, Europe and uh, around the world. Uh, I think it's very important what you said that uh, employers, employment agencies, training agencies should be also involved uh, in the integration process, which was also one of the goal of our project to involve these um, institutions in, uh, in our countries. Um, thank you very much again. Thank you. <laughs> Now, uh, I would like to uh, introduce um, our second speaker. Uh, this is Miss uh, Sonia Morano Puadi. She is professor of law at the Oxford Brooks University School of Law. Uh, she is also the director of the Postgraduate Research uh, Students Program. 
She's, uh, her research is focusing on the relationship between citizenship, migration, and fundamental rights in the context of an enlarging European Union. Uh, she is on the editorial board of the Journal of Immigration and Sci Asylum and Nationality uh, Law. I find very interesting uh, um, her work in the Combat Project, uh, a project which was mentioned in a 2017 European Parliament, Parliament motion for a resolution and which proposes that training on identification of victims of human trafficking should be a legal requirement for people working into the hospitality sector. Uh, Ms. Morano Fuadi uh, also has a number of important positions uh, where she can uh, contribute with her expertise. She is uh, a steering committee member of the University of Migration and Refugees Network, also chair of the Fundamental Rights and Equality Research Group of Oxford Brookes University, member of the Society of Legal Scholars in UK, and uh, member of the steering committee of the Migration and Law Academic Network in the UK. So we have the pleasure to have a uh, really experienced and distinguished speaker today. Uh, Ms. Uh, Morano, it's, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Actually, uh, I don't know, I hope you know, I will uh, meet the expectation of this floor because my uh, presentation will be more a sort of an academic style <laughs> presentation. So a little bit different from uh, uh, what you know have been uh, uh, told is going to be the rest of the day. So if uh, possible, I will share my screen. Um, and uh, so what, what I'm going to focus today, uh, and of course, you know, as I say, thank you for this wonderful project, you know, thank you to the WIN uh, uh, Consortium for inviting me. But you know, what I would like to focus today is not so much uh, the side of the labor integration, uh, but you know, more uh, the framework, uh, so the legal and policy framework um, that we have uh, in relation to human trafficking. And uh, in particular, I would like you know, actually to stress that you know, despite we have done so much you know, in this field and we continue doing it, we still have a number of problems, uh, particularly in relation to the extraterritoriality of some of the legal measures. Uh, so what happened, for instance, where there are some victims which are distressed at sea uh, and they are not really within the territorial uh, sea of any of the countries. Of your, obviously, in Europe, we are talking about um, European countries which are members of the Council of Europe and members of the European Union. So um, I will actually look at, you know, uh, I don't really have a lot of time, so I will try to look at, you know, some of the issues that I believe, you know, are important. And we also found out in our combat project, one of the issue is uh, the identification of the victims. And another issue is uh, how to identify those victims, how to distinguish between uh, victims which are um, simply uh, victim of trafficking or you know simply um, smugglers um, migrants and so how to define you know that and uh, what happened when uh, those victims are stranded for instance at sea um, so just to briefly give an overview of uh, the pressure uh, that we have right now uh, of course, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic has uh, highlighted, you know, many other problems. And, and of course, you know, we do have a sort of a general picture, a picture here, uh, and we do see certain, uh, certain Eastern and Western Mediterranean routes and board that, you know, basically are used by smugglers to uh, reach the European Union. Obviously, those routes might change in accordance to the different dynamics uh, 
uh, including legal dynamics um, moved by the different institutions of the European Union. But we can actually say that the main, the increase of the migration flows happened in 2015. That's actually in accordance to some of the official documents of the European Union, even though academics might place the migratory pressure in 1990 with the extension of uh, Schengen, um, the Schengen visas to African countries. But, you know, looking at the uh, data, official data, we can see that 2015 as a big, big um, moment, uh, a milestone in the increase of the migration flows. Then we have, you know, that similar experience, uh, uh, even recently we see in Spain, and there are several reports that relate to the 2020 um, concern, you know, in relation to the um, uh, Spanish uh, route. Then even the English Channel um, seems to have experienced, you know, an increase and a span in a week, you know, with the more than 1,000 individuals crossing across the Channel. And, you know, not really um, to, for to forget about the Afghan crisis and the escalation that, you know, we are going to be faced. Um, uh, I mean, we are already faced. Uh, we have already a number of countries who are responding to this crisis, but, you know, many countries are not responding. So we will see that there is obviously going to be a, an influx and, and raise an increase in the migration pressure. Um, so uh, we have this situation, but you know, what is the legal, legal framework you know, that we have in Europe? So in Europe, we have a very complex legal framework. So theoretically, we could really say that the standard of protection is quite high. Why we theoretically say that? Because we have different instruments. So we have the EU trafficking directive, which is the 2011 36 directive. We have the, the Convention um, of, of the Council of Europe, so the Convention on Action Against uh, Human Trafficking. We have the Charter of Fundamental Rights. We have, you know, the Convention of the European Convention of Human Rights, and in particular, Article 4. So, you know, everybody really thinks, you know, that the European uh, continent is a paradise, you know, in terms of uh, protection, particularly in relation to um, certain areas, so human rights and trafficking. However, what actually we might say is that this very complex and overlapping system of legal norms offer the possibility of the member state to escape their legal responsibilities. So because it's so complex then, there are pro probably problems in the practical functioning of this legal system. And of course, you know, this presentation will approach the protection of uh, trafficking victims from a human, a human rights uh, perspective, but also particularly looking at the European Union, because we have heard uh, Greta and what Greta is doing and what the Council of Europe is doing. So we want to offer a different perspective, you know, to that particular perspective. One of the, of the issue and the problem that I believe, you know, we have in Europe is the issue of the so-called externalization of border controls. Um, so in an attempt to prevent irregular migration and irregular migrants from entering the European territory, the institution uh, have uh, and the member state, the institution of the European Union, you know, have tried to outsource the border controls to uh, third countries, uh, which are not European. Of course, you know, even though the um, officials of the European Union, they don't really mention the word externalization, they mainly talk about external dimension of migration, of global approaches, or neighborhood policies, but the, re the reality is that there is a form of outsourcing of those border controls. And obviously, even though this form might be temporal or spatial, you know, what we have is a situation of uh, legislation being adopted to carry out control before the irregular migrant can even reach the actual physical border. And these borders control are taken outside of the territories of the states. And some of the time they are taken on the high sea, for instance, or on the territories of third countries. And they are actually targeting migrants and uh, asylum seekers. 
the justification that the European Union, obviously the member states are bringing for strengthening the border controls uh, are actually based on the fact that uh, the priority of their agenda is uh, to fight against smuggling of migrants. Okay, so actually is is very good. You know, we had you know several operations. It's good you know to fight against smuggling of uh, migrants. However, targeting smugglers uh, or smuggler migrants or targeting the smugglers might contribute to the increase of the crime of human trafficking. And in fact, you know, this crime is uh, characterized by impunity and exploitation of the victims. So impunity. Uh, for the perpetrators and exploitation of the victims. So several reports have shown that migrants risk becoming victims of torture and rape whilst traveling, and the risk is particularly high for unaccompanied minors and women that are traveling alone. And of course, you know, this uh, report are not really showing that there is a strict link between uh, the irregular migration and the irregular work, but you know we can actually see that there is a trend towards that. So the irregular mi uh, migration or you know problems in Libya are not really strictly connected, or might not really be proved. You know that they are connected with the lab with the labor um, irregular labor, for instance, in Europe. But many studies show that. So the externalization of borders should also include identification and protection and support of actual and potential victims of trafficking. If it doesn't do that, it's not really working and functioning as it should work. So in other words, you know, we can say that the legal responsibility is in normal situation stands with each member state, so they have the responsibility to identify actual and potential victims. But, you know, the legislation here is even the directive is pretty vague. You know, they talk about reasonable, reasonable grounds indication. But, you know, even the directive doesn't really say what is this reasonable ground indication. But, you know, they obviously mentioned that there should be a reasonable ground indication that migrants and asylum seekers would be victims of trafficking. And there has been given large discretion to the national authorities. So, and, you know, but, you know, so that, that's why, you know, just the way in which the framework of the legislation is made is uh, giving too much discretion to the national authorities and to the states a normal situation of influx. So when actually there is not a so-called crisis, when we are in a context of uh, a mass influxes, so when we define the situation impossible for the member state to cope, you know, let's think about, you know, in 2015, Italy and Greece, you know, the, their capabilities was uh, put at a very severe risk. So then there is a situation of emergency. So there is an expectation, you know, legal expectation that member states contribute and they have this so-called intra-union um, uh, solidarity. So they show solidarity one towards the other. So they have a positive obligation to assist one another. And this is stated in primary legislation. So it's stated in the treaties on the functioning of the European Union. One of the main issues that we find, which is quite um, delicate from a legal perspective, is that there are actually two separate obligations. So there is a dichotomy between the investigation of the perpetrators and the identification and the protection of victims. And this actually means that um, the two um, uh, crimes or the two situations, the two obligations are separate and therefore, you know, they could potentially, they could be given extraterritorial application to the identification and protection of victims. So, for instance, if we look at um, some of the case law from the, the Court of Human Rights in relation to the interpretation of Article 4, Article 4 of the convention prohibits slavery and forced labor, 
and also includes uh, cross-border trafficking, we can see that you know, the Court of Human Rights says that there is a difference between, so in the, in the J and others case versus Austria, say that there is a difference between the duty to identify and provide substantive assistance and support to victims of human trafficking and so on one side and on the other side the procedural obligation to investigate the crime under international and EU law. So it sounds that the two obligations are separate and even the, the, the directive talks about you know the need to, for the member states to establish appropriate mechanisms aimed at an early identification, assistance and support of victims in cooperation with the different organisations and actually divide the two obligations, say, you know, just uh, on the one hand, we have uh, the identification of the victim even before, during and after the conclusion of the criminal proceedings and then Obviously, this is actually going to happen as soon as there is a reasonable ground indication for believing that the person might be a victim of human trafficking. So how to identify, as I said, is not really connected to the territory. It's not really done if actually somebody is stranded at sea, in the high sea, we can leave that person stranded and we don't really have any duty but if it's in our territory, we might actually, the national authority might look at that. No, that's actually not the case. So it's, the two obligations are separate. So even if there is a territorial limit for the uh, investigation of the prosecutor, there is not such a territorial limit for the uh, protection of victims. So, but how to identify is complex because it's linked to this wide margin of discretion left to the national authorities. So basically, if the national authorities have a wider understanding of what it is victimhood, for instance, or what is the vulnerability issue of how to uh, interpret, you know, vulnerable victims, at that point, you know, the protection might be granted. But it's also interesting to understand the position of the Court of Human Rights and see that even in this case, in the Claudury case, the Court of Human Rights gave some int, gave some types of tests. It simply said, we need to protect not just the actual victims, but also the potential one. And how we do that? Because, you know, when we look at situation of vulnerability of irregular migrants, for instance, so when we have, you know, the people, and in that case, where um, it was in Greece and there were irregular migrants that were recruited in Greece to pick up strawberries. So the Court of Human Rights said the, the, the mere fact that those people were irregular migrants meant that they were vulnerable and therefore they were um, without sources, risking arrest, risking detention, risking deportation, and therefore they had to do to be protected as uh, potential victims. So even before the identification was happening. So this actually makes clear that um, we have, because of the two separate obligations, so one is to perpetuate the criminals and the other one is to protect the victims, the territorial scope of application of the legislation is, uh, could be wider. And how can it be wider? It could potentially be wider applying the Article 10 of the directive that simply Article 10, you know, put a legal nexus for the prosecution. But the Article 11 of the directive does not really put that legal um, limit. It actually gives the possibility of investigating beyond the territory of the state. And when this article is read, this article of the directive is read in conjunction with, the, with Article 5 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, we can see that there is no such a thing as a territorial limit because the convention has got a territorial limit. So there is an issue of extraterritoriality of the convention, but that is not very clear 
for the charter. We are still waiting for the Court of Justice to uh, give an OP, uh, a, a judgment in relation to extraterritoriality of the charter. But you know, looking at Article 11 of the directive and Article 5 of the charter, we can't really find any limitation in relation to the territory. Because you know, the charter is simply based on the, criter the criterion of connection with union law. So as long as union law applies, so for member states to apply the law and from uh, uh, the institution also in their application of the law. So if the connection is made, that connection is not limited to the territory of Europe or one state. So it can go beyond that. However, having said that, we are still waiting for the Court of Justice to clarify and to explain the issue of extraterritoriality in relation to trafficking in particular. And therefore, you know, just to conclude, this uh, uh, perspective that I've been giving about the importance of uh, Union law in particular, of course, you know, we, we have seen that most of the directive and no, directive is in line with uh, the, convention, the Council of Europe Convention and, and of course, is in line with the, um, the uh, Article 4 of the European um, uh, Convention of Human Rights. However, what's the trafficking directive right in conjunction with the Charter does is adding another layer is adding another layer of protection, a more generous approach that goes beyond the national dimension, the national territories, and it does cover situations which are not really captured by international law. They escape international law. And also the states actually escape their responsibility because obviously the state, you know, say we have not really, we don't have to follow, you know, international law because, you know, those victims are stranded, for instance, at sea, high sea, outside our territory. And unless there is a legal nexus, we are not really, we don't have to protect them. That actually doesn't really sound right if we apply the trafficking directive and the charter together, because actually in this way, there is a sort of a general protection of course, you know, this is a lex veranda, so it's a doctrinal perspective because we still don't have a clear um, case of the Court of Justice in relation to this, but, you know, that's actually where the doctrine is developing. Uh, thank you very much, you know, for uh, listening, uh, and it's been really a pleasure uh, to give the presentation and to stay with you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, you are, this is very, was very interesting uh, point of view of combining uh, different legislation uh, for the best interest uh, of the, the victims. I think uh, you have uh, pointed on very important uh, issues like identification of the victims of trafficking among migrants, asylum seekers and refugees. Just want to share that in Bulgaria we don't as a first border and maybe transit country for them. We don't have even one person identified uh, officially by the state as a uh, victim of uh, trafficking. And also I find very interesting this very difficult balance between, um, uh, let's say, the approach that protects the interest of the state, the, the safety and security from one side, which is based on uh, ideas like irregular migration, cross-border crime, um, fear of terrorism, and the other approach, which is more on uh, protecting the rights of the migrants, uh, refugees and asylum seekers of not being violated, including of not being uh, victims of uh, trafficking. Um, now I would uh, like uh, to uh, give the floor uh, to everyone to, to ask questions, <laughs> uh, to share opinion, to give examples. So I'm opening a discussion based on what we heard from our first uh, presenters, Ms. Antoneta Vasilieva, Vasilieva and Sonia Murano Fuadi. Please feel free to ask questions. You can do it in the chat, but also you can do it by raising your hand with this uh, little button at the bottom of your screen. 
and uh, yeah, and you can switch your camera and microphone if you want. So. few minutes for reflection. <laughs> there is already a question, Nadia. Oh, yeah. Where from Teresa. I don't see it in the chat. Huh. No, I raised the hand. Oh, Nadia. sorry. I haven't. Okay, <laughs> no, maybe. Sorry, I have to. Oh, then I have. Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, thank you, thank you. Sonia, I found your presentation absolutely fascinating. Maybe because I'm, you know, uh, I'm very humbly uh, graduated in law and with a fixation on some of the uh, issues they, that you touched upon. So uh, let, me, let me be a bit provocative uh, also to check whether I fully understood the potentialities of this um, case uh, judged by the uh, the court of uh, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, Jay and others against Austria. So potentially, and correct me if I'm wrong, and please bring the consequences of this sentence up to the. <laughs> Up to the ideal world uh, where borders no make make no sense uh, any longer, but if I'm if I understand well, irregular migrants, wherever they are on the EU territory, let's stick to the EU territory because it's already it's already enough for me for the time being. Okay, would be potentially eligible to request to be regularized what do i mean by regularized uh, they would be in the position to request a residence permit for the time being a residence permit then we should also discuss whether they should be allowed to work um, because they are potentially victims of trafficking uh, because they are the irregularity of their status vis-a-vis uh, the migration law, the immigration and asylum law in the destination country could put them potentially in the situation to be recruited and exploited. Did I understand well the potential consequences of this sentence? Thank you very much. You know, you are basically correct. Um, the only thing, you know, that um, is not correct is the case. So the case is the uh, code Jordi versus and others versus Greece. So it's not the G, the J one is the one where the court of human rights basically say that we have two separate obligations. So one is to uh, prosecute the perpetrators and the other one is to protect the victims. And actually that's very, very important because you know that's actually brings up my point about the protection of the directive also outside the territory of the different member states because you know if the two obligations were seen as one they could be potentially be the argument that there is no protection outside the European Union because of uh, article 10 of the directive that say that the protection is just uh, with the legal, legal nexus. Mm. Um, Sonia can I can I uh, just uh, reply on this no there is no protection outside the investigation not outside of the European Union, outside of the investigation, because normally we were taught hmm, that a victim of trafficking is identified by law enforcement and judiciary forces, NGOs, you know, all these human rights are, okay, are for us, you know, civil society, it's a toy to play with uh, and to keep us busy while law enforcement, judiciary and state authorities, they crack down on immigration and uh, uh, criminal immigrants because immigrants who are irregular, they are criminal by default. So there is no protection outside the investigation. I agree. So it's just like the, the point is this, you know, that the, the, because, you know, the two obligations are separate, you cannot really protect outside of the European, you cannot really investigate a case, so you cannot really criminalize criminals outside of the European Union, but 
In Article 11 of the directive, there is no such a limitation, territorial limitation for the protection of victims. And that's actually very interesting because, you know, you, if you decouple the two obligations, you can say, okay, there is no extraterritoriality for the uh, prosecution elements, so the investigation elements, but, you know, there is, there might be a potential protection because, you know, the directive is silent and when interpreted in line with the, with the charter, there is no such a thing as a delimitation of territory. So the territorial de delimitation, that's why I actually raised the issue with that case. The other case that you were mentioning about the regular migration is quite interesting too. And I think if we interpret this in this way, so this case, as I said, the applicants were irregular migrants that were recruited in Greece and they were um, picking strawberries. So the Court of Human Rights in that situation was very, very strong. It said that those could be potential victims of trafficking simply because of or, this, or servitude, trafficking or servitude. So also apply, applying Article 4, which is uh, uh, protect, you know, the servitude and forced labor. Um, and, and the reason for that was because of their vulnerabilities, because being irregular migrants, they were without sources, they were risking arrest, they were even risking detention, deportation by the law enforcement in Greece. So that actually case makes a link between the issue of vulnerability and shows that even those who are not identified as victims, they are, in any case, they can't really be left. They should be looked at because of their intrinsic position of vulnerabilities, which stands with their status of irregular migrants. That's actually that case about. And therefore, there should be a nexus for for trafficking so uh, it's not really automatic mm -hmm. it needs to be but you know it can't really be left stranded but at the same time we have to say that because of the wide margin of discretion left to the national authorities we have to say that unfortunately there is no such a thing as a strong control from the eu institution because you know they even the directive leaves a discretion, <laughs> and discretion is wide, it's not limited discretion, it's a wide discretion. So it pretty much depends then on what is the definition used or what is the conceptual, how is conceptualized at national level, the issue of uh, victimization, the issue of vulnerabilities, and you know, all those uh, irrelevant uh, and important um, areas. I, I, I don't know whether... Yeah. I, I would like to say that uh, uh, fr uh, from a grassroots level, this was one of the conclusions uh, that we made here in Bulgaria, that instead of uh, being so focused on identification of victims of trafficking, we have to be to put out more our efforts on identification of vulnerabilities to trafficking among women who are uh, entering our uh, country as uh, refugees or asylum seekers. Very and, fascinating. And, yeah. and, 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 and this I fully agree, Nadia, but then I would have a question for all the NGOs who that participated in the project. How come that you were able, on the basis of which legal document, you were able to um, support the labor market uh, integration of the victims that you assisted? Because then now I'm really curious. Yeah, this was uh, one of the issue because we were... Um, I bet this yeah, was a yeah, big issue. A big issue because we, we, uh, we, uh, there was a requirement to support only the people who have uh, uh, permission to stay in our countries, which I personally find very uh, frustrating <laughs> uh, for myself. Of course, you know, NGOs, we always find a way to support other people. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but yes, th this was a requirement. Yes, Nadia, I, I remember, sorry, I'm, no. I think I'm the oldest here. So, and I think, unfortunately, I started to deal with trafficking and particularly 
I'm sorry if I remember my first victim of trafficking was from Bulgaria at the time when Bulgaria was, was not in the European Union. And um, so, and, 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 and definitely people, the issue of uh, uh, residence uh, and work has been always, always a headache for all of us um, mm. since, since uh, the, 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 the very beginning, because now uh, the contradictions that you are highlighting are growing and growing. Uh, so, yes, sorry. Okay, Tanasis wants to raise a question and then it's uh, Vanessa. I think I just wanted to contribute to the discussion because I find it very interesting. So first of all, about the Greek case, it's a very famous case and thank you very much, Sonia, for bringing it up. Uh, we used to call it Manolada case because Manolada is the region and actually Greece was condemned and Greece had to pay uh, people, uh, I think an amount of 10 to 16,000 euros, I don't remember, because it violated, uh, the state violated um, the right of, of those people. So I think it's a very interesting case and actually civil society and at the grassroots level uh, really supported uh, the people to uh, go to the European uh, court. Uh, a second um, thing that I wanted to contribute uh, is about the externalization of the borders. I found it very interesting. And I think to add, to add on this, I think the securitization of the borders and the securitization of migration policy uh, at the EU level, but also at the, at the national level is also very important. We see more fences, we see more pushbacks in the sea. And I think that really increases the risk of people to being trafficked because they have to find more risky ways and more difficult ways to actually cross. Um, and then uh, a third thing that I wanted to add, and I stop, uh, is the, the, the question of Ter Teresa for NGOs. I think uh, when we try to support, since I come also, my background is also from NGOs. Uh, when we try to support uh, people, we support them in a more holistic way. So the issue of the document is one uh, level. So. The first thing is that we try to actually find ways for this person to have documents, any kind of documents. It could be from migration pathway, it could be from asylum pathway, it could be from a victim of trafficking pathway, uh, depending of course on the legal context. And then at the same, uh, at the same time, we try to empower the person, uh, help the person with language courses, with uh, soft skills. So I think, we try to sit in a holistic way. Uh, of course, without documents, there is no way to find a, a decent job and a, and a legal job. Uh, but we work simultaneously in different levels. So when the person has documents, if we manage, of course, uh, then he or she will be uh, more empowered to actually uh, apply for jobs and, and secure an income. Sorry, Vanessa, then I, I just need to reply very quickly to Thanasis and then I, I will leave you. Yes, Thanasis, I understand. I was in your in your shoes years ago, but the great credibility of the system is nothing, is absolutely nothing. Because if you, sure, we work on a case by case basis and we identify the most suitable way to legalize the status of every individual because every individual story is different but the credibility of the system is is of, of your of the greek system of the italian system of the austrian system is really really very low because we end up by trying whatever we can without having a system that coherently addresses vulnerabilities and this is the reason why victims do not denounce victims do not come up um, they just prefer being exploited because now people prefer being exploited because at the end of the day, they always gain something, no matter the level of exploitation. Okay, Vanessa, and then maybe Sonia will also uh, reply. Okay, in just to answer Teresa, you know, here in Spain, we had the same problem. Uh, women for uh, to have the possibility to integrate women into the labor market, you need to be officially identified as a victim of trafficking. Trafficking, 
uh, by the national forces, the uh, police, and, and also by, by your tribunals, or, or police or tribunals. And, um, and, and on the other hand, we had the opportunities also to integrate into the labor market uh, women with uh, an international protection, maybe no ident not identified as, such, as as victims of trafficking, of trafficking, but with an international protection grant. Um, it was interesting to hear in our national event that the spokesperson coming from the Ministry of Equality uh, that participate in the conference um, are. And she said that they are they are trying to modify our legislation and to have an integrate uh, an, an integrate law against trafficking that uh, probably is going to allow NGOs to identify victims for all the rights they are supposed to be provided uh, by your legislation and on, on not only through the police identification. I don't know how it's going to be in, in reality because we don't have even a draft, but she said something like that because organizations, NGOs, we always said the same thing. In fact, this, this is this has been one of the problems of the implementation of, of WIM project in Spain. Uh, as well, because we started uh, to work with women with uh, a permission to stay and work in Spain, but it was a very limited permission. And while we were working on the project, some of the women lost the permission because it's like a three month grant or something like that. And it's such a pity because you really see that you're working with the victim of trafficking, but she doesn't want to tell tribunals, she doesn't want to tell police because she doesn't feel like uh, she's going to be safe enough, she's afraid, she doesn't want to. But you know you are working with a trafficking of victims that need uh, a complete reintegration. You are completely right. Yeah. Sorry, Sonia, I will... Sorry, Nadia. I'm... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm... <laughs> Sorry if I reply directly immediately to Vanessa. No, yes. Uh, you know, again, this issue of NGOs identifying victims Again, I am too old, and this is the reason why I just uh, dropped uh, trafficking issues, and now I'm on other issues because I was too frustrated after 20 years of discussions in Italy of having multidisciplinary teams putting together law enforcement and NGOs in order to identify vulnerabilities, including in the labor inspection forces because then we are again discussing labor exploitation vulnerability to exploitation in the labor market and then i also i'm surprised that no one mentions the employers sanction directive as if you know because we are maybe too much focused on the fact that victims of trafficking are a victim of a crime rather than victims uh, of uh, labor exploitation and uh, of an illicit behavior of employers, not only of traffickers. Uh, employers in a, wide, uh, in a wide sense, including clients of sexual services. Um, at the end of the day, what we force them to do is to lie in order to access asylum uh, asylum uh, and international protection, even in cases when they are not eligible for such for such protection. So we just destroy both systems, the asylum system and the immigration system that does not exist at the end of the day. Okay, uh, uh, Sonia, then Antonetta wants to say something and we have a question in the chat. Uh, uh, Sonia, do you want to yeah, I just just want to re to say that you know that's was my the introduction of my presentation was that even in, if in theory we can say that our legal system is uh, is perfect, you know we have so many overlapping pieces of legislation, you know in Europe at least. The reality is that even within the law. So, for instance, in the directive is written that the reasonable, um, uh, so all, all the elements of the identification and even the interpretation of certain concepts are left at the national level. 
And of course, you know, if they are left at the national level there, you know, it pretty much depends on, also on the people uh, in charge at the time, uh, on the police, you know, uh, on the on the government or on the political uh, venue. So, for instance, if you think about the UK right now, you know, every, I mean, it, we don't have lorry drivers because of Brexit. We have lorry drivers because of the recruitment contract. What? <laughs> so it's just like, uh, so obviously you can justify everything, you know, at local or national level. So there should be a, a way of dealing with the law in a very effective way. And also, you know, making sure that the law is stronger. And in relation to um, integration, integration, for instance, within the European Union, the integration into the labor market is left at, um, at the level of policy. There is no strong legal uh, instrument that actually say it because you know that's actually the competence of the union so integration mm -hmm. is uh, within the state competence so it's left you know to national policy so it pretty much depends on how the national policy react and it, it pretty much depends on what is the 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 political will of that specific state uh because of course you know even the political will can change uh but and whether there are policy of integration or uh, integration is simply left you know to the bottom-up approach and therefore the ngos are the one and and actually i call it that that's a, a type of solidarity of distributed solidarity because you know it's up to the the NGOs and the capabilities of the NGOs, but it pretty much depends on the work of voluntaries most of the time. So is it this actually a legal responsibility of the state? And how the state, you know, deal with that? And of course, you know, we don't we don't have a legal responsibility in the case of integration. You know, there's not really a strong um, element. You know, it's just pretty much, you know, left mm -hmm. to the level of policy. And another wants to say something, and then we have two. Uh, we have a lot of questions actually <laughs> in the chat, several questions. Maybe we won't be able to answer all of them. Uh, yeah, because we are already over the time, but Antoinette, please. Yes, very shortly uh, to uh, add to, to the discussion. Uh, the political will, I think, is the main <laughs> bridge uh, between uh, what uh, Ms. Albano says and uh, Ms. Morano also says, because I think we have a pretty good uh, uh, international uh, law. I think the EU directive is uh, strong. Of course, I'm not professor in law, but I think also that the uh, the Convention on Human Trafficking is also very strong and gives a very, um, very uh, broad and, uh, in the same time, uh, precise uh, frame how countries can, uh, what countries have to do to develop their policies, specifically the Article 12, um, when assisting victims, including in labor uh, integration and in inclusion and social inclusion. And I think the the, the main thing is how we implement law, not only national, but international. And this is this is where the political will comes and where the understanding of the, the people who are working on grass level uh, comes. And I think that uh, what, what, what uh, Sonia said is very, very good. And I wish uh, many policemen and prosecutors to be able, be able to, to hear you and to understand this really broad and complex uh, uh, mindset that you just presented us, but what is important is that um, actually states should be able to implement um, um, policies that are effective and they don't need to complicate it, I think, in international instruments. And uh, I think that trafficking human beings is a very dynamic and uh, fast developing crime. And we are not developing uh, very fast in implementing actions against it. And um, that's why I think it's very important uh, what countries are doing. And uh, in our monitoring work, we do uh, in the third evaluation um, round, we did recommend to all the countries to all the countries that uh, had already went through the third uh, evaluation round, that they should make further efforts to support victims of trafficking, their economic and social inclusions through education, vocation training, and job 
placement. Uh, moreover, such efforts should involve raising awareness among different employers and promotion of micro businesses and social enterprises because um, this is what really makes the huge difference for victim after they're out of the, the trafficking because I, I fully agree that identification is crucial. We see downgrading detection of victims, but we, we face a lot of challenges to integrate victims who are already identified in Bulgaria, in many countries I've seen this year through the monitoring monitoring that, that we've done. So it's very, very important we to stick to the small actions that really make a difference and uh, really not be too precise uh, in, uh, in implementing the law, but be more proactive in implementing the law. Okay, uh, thank you. I will just uh, summarize uh, in the chat. People agree that uh, the legal framework is fine, but it's uh, the implementation, the, the major bottleneck. Also, uh, Susanne Hoff says that it's good uh, the, uh, that the European Section Directive is mentioned uh, and the evaluation report has just been published. However, there are also major gaps in the implementation of this directive, plus it will not help victims of, uh, for sex workers to claim back uh, wages. Um, and there is, uh, yeah, there are several uh, uh, other uh, maybe I'm not able to read everything, but maybe this question, there is also one question which I think will be answered in the process of the next discussion after the break, which is from Stella, uh, I don't, can't read the whole name. Uh, please, I want to know what are the policies that has been put in place in countries of where victims and traffickers came from the uh, came from to break the cultural background to taking prostitution as a normal job avenue to provide for once and the entire family. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I I, I uh, propose that now we have a short break if there are not any other burning questions for like maybe 10 minutes now it's uh, 10 to uh, 11 uh, your time maybe we can have a break till 20 to 11 uh, uh, 20 past 11 11 20 okay 10 minutes break just for short coffee water don't go out uh, don't, don't stop the link just uh, switch off your camera and mute your microphone and we will be back in 10 minutes thank you Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to um, invite uh, Susanne Hoff to introduce uh, her to us, to everybody. She uh, is since 2004, quite a long time, international coordinator of Ostrada International, which currently is the is European NGO platform against trafficking in human beings and uh, involves uh, 25 members, 25 NGOs, and five associate members from 24 European countries. The aim of Ostrada is to prevent trafficking in human beings and exploitation in Europe and to protect the rights of trafficked and exploited persons and ensure their access to justice. Before La Strada, uh, Susanna worked in different contexts like NGOs, the Dutch Center for International Cooperation, the Dutch Refugee uh, Council, and also for the Amsterdam Mayor's Office and the Amsterdam Municipality, where her work focused on human rights and the situation of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, Susanna, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yours. Yes, I hope you can hear me well. And thank you, Nadia, very much for inviting me for this event today. I must say, because of all the discussion, it's quite difficult also to stick uh, uh, more to the topic. And uh, yeah, I had prepared some presentations, so I might slightly change a little bit. Uh, also, it gives me maybe the opportunity to, to quickly react um, 
already what was said. I do believe that human trafficking uh, does exist. However, I do very much agree that the framework is very limited, uh, that the crime is very difficult to prove and uh, successfully prosecute. And I also see, of course, as a as an NGO platform, we see, of course, that uh, it leaves many without the protection and support. And also reacting to the other earlier speakers, uh, yes, it's. Uh, I think it's quite uh, unrealistic. Uh, even though we would love to to have an, uh, a human rights place for all, uh, that all the undocumented workers, of which there are of course many now in Europe, will have access to adequate assistance and support. Even though, as Nadia, she also mentioned it, uh, we call for that, and we see actually an urgent need um, not to wait till people are trafficked and give only support to those who uh, who face serious accidents or serious situation of human trafficking or forced labor, but already before to address the vulnerabilities of a much larger group. And of course, I do agree with the current speakers. That's very difficult, not only in the current climate, but also with the current framework we have to deal with. And uh, yeah, and the limited resources and time of everyone, while at the same time, of course, yeah, we see so many people in need of support and, 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 and help. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank also, uh, I'm, I'm very curious actually to hear more about the WIND project and also to hear the next speaker, because I think we definitely need more of those projects in Europe, especially as much in the anti-trafficking field, and this is partly also mentioned already by different speakers, uh, a much focus has been put on short-term level assistance of victims, and generally uh, much focus is of course also put just on the criminal aspect of the crime, aiming to ensure investigation and prosecution, and much less attention has been put on the longer run protection and well-being of trafficked persons, regardless the responsibility of the state, as mentioned also by the previous speaker, Sonia Fote Morano. I hope I pr pronounce your, your name correctly. Um, while the WIND project has been focusing in particular on ensuring access to employment to women trafficked for sexual exploitation, I would like to highlight in my presentation a little bit more generally the need for social inclusion of trafficked persons, which of course was also the basis for your project, and to share some challenges and recommendations we have seen in our work. Uh, I was planning to be quite general on that also because we represent uh, actually a platform of 25 members and five associate members, as you said, and we are actually based in 24 European countries. So you can imagine um, that the situation is quite different in the different countries. A last word on La Strade International, uh, like the Animals Association Foundation in Bulgaria, which is for long uh, our member in Bulgaria and also one of the founders of La Strade International. Uh, we see uh, all our members actually direct assist traffic persons, they do advocacy, raise awareness and provide uh, direct support, as I said, but also to a larger vulnerable group of persons. So we have also a lot of uh, NGOs that are members of us who work specifically with undocumented workers. I just wanted to have said this so the listeners also understand uh, where we are uh, coming from. So as mentioned already by the different speakers today, and I hope that I keep the time because I see that we are a little bit late on the schedule, um, that a lot of the uh, a lot of people uh, that have experienced the trafficking situation are of course in urgent need of protection and support. Uh, as we all know, they have experienced psychological psychological consequences re resulting, of course, from the abuses they have suffered, uh, and that can also the consequences can include. The loss of dignity, the mental health problems, uh, a loss of confidence and a dis diminished ability to act also autonomously as a consequence of being under constant control and in fear. And I'm sure that the WIND project um, faced also these challenges. So while firstly, it's of course very much important that these consequences are addressed and that victims receive the adequate protection and support and are thus empowered again to take back the control over their lives. It is also very important that in the longer run, social inclusion of trafficked persons uh, is realized. And that's whether in the country of destination or after return to their country of origin. Also uh, to reduce again their vulnerability and the risks for new forms of exploitation as also Antoinette earlier highlighted today. However, when we, and I'm sure this is the same for the WIND project, but when our members in general try 
to look at longer run uh, uh, support and protection to traffic persons, um, and also to try to realize social inclusion, uh, then first of all, there are certain basic conditions and requirements that should be met. And the first one is, of course, it sounds very logic, and it has already been mentioned also by, by Sonia before, but it's, of course, very important that victims of human trafficking are formally identified as trafficked persons, also to ensure that they receive already in the beginning adequate assistance and support, and that the rehabilitation of victims of trafficking can start to begin, can take place. Uh, but regardless the obligation for states, again, the identification of traffic persons remains a very big gap at the European level. Um, I don't know the exact percentage, but we see uh, Eurostat reports around 10 to 12,000 people that are identified, reported to be identified by member states each year in Europe. And that's just about 1% of the high estimations that we hear from international organizations. So whether the estimations are correct or not, there's a major gap of the victims that we really see in practice and that are identified very often preliminary identified by our members and then reported to the states uh, and the, the high estimations. So that's the first uh, uh, major bottleneck. The second prerequisite for longer term social inclusion is of course appropriate and secure accommodation, counseling and information, translation of information, legal aid and assistance during criminal procedures, and of course access to residents and also in the discussion, we already talked about this, uh, as well as access to safe return. Um, as for access to residents, I will not say too much about it, but I would like to highlight, and maybe I can mention this in the chat, uh, we have been lobbying and we are still lobbying uh, for more access, uh, not only on the short term, but also in the long term for access to residents. Uh, there was a, a project launched called REST, uh, which six of our members implemented uh, in six countries in Europe, including the Netherlands, uh, Moldova, Serbia, Austria, and I can share in the chat and also their recommendations, because what we see again in Europe, uh, that also uh, there's an enormous lack to temporary access to residents, and also the uh, reflection and recovering period is, uh, is very often not granted uh, to trafficked persons, especially to those who have, and if we speak about third country nationals, to those who have um, uh, a Dublin claim. Um, I know because of the time, so I skip a little bit, but uh, yeah, as mentioned already, if a person cannot stay regularly in the country or has no access to regular employment, it is of course very difficult to obtain social inclusion and the risk for exploitation and re-trafficking increases. So um, let me go to integration and longer term support. Um, for the process of recovery and economic and social inclusion, um, settlement in safe and a secure environment is of course needed, next to of course access to a reasonable standard of living, mental and physical well-being, opportunities for personal social and economic development and also access to social and emotional support. And this of course, as the previous speaker said, this should not be created with social dumping, but it should indeed be a labour market that uh, is inclusive for all and ensures that everyone has, uh, yeah, equal standards, minimum wage, equal access to support, and not that some people, and I don't think that the Bulgarian in that case was actually um, so happy with that circumstances, but very often, uh, because if, if it's exactly the same situation, uh, you would also see that this mother in, in the case story would probably have chosen Italian if it would not have costed more, and then maybe not much access to employment and support. So unfortunately, that's the reality uh, of today, even though we also are very much concerned about social dumping, but still also see the lack of opportunities for others uh, to enter the labor migrant, uh, migrant market. As for empowerment, uh, as Nadia also asked me to say a little bit about empowerment, but I'm sure that the next speaker will explain all the difficult challenges, but also the um, options you did to empower persons and to try to get them uh, access to employment and vocational training. We feel that empowerment is a central element of the human rights approach to social and economic change. And empower means, means for us participation of trafficked persons in taking decisions that concern them, including in programs and services 
which they will uh, benefit from. However, social uh, successful integration, and yeah, we heard already several examples, it's not, fair, it's not easy at all. Uh, first of all, it of course depends to a large extent on the victim's individual situation or the experience. Uh, and secondly, of course, also to the social and economic factors, and especially also in which country is the person based in a country like Germany, Austria, maybe Netherlands, there might be more opportunities to enter the market again. Then, for example, in Moldova, Bulgaria, uh, especially if um, the lack of uh, economic opportunity was the, the reason in the first place to maybe leave uh, the country and to seek for opportunities abroad. We also see that the reintegration is a long term process which requires work within the traffic uh, with the traffic person, but also with the environment. So the family, the community, sometimes also the state. And it also depends, as I mentioned already before, on all the support the person had so far received and the outcomes of it. Uh, for example, what has been the outcome of the court case? Has the, has the perpetrator been prosecuted? But also, has there been any access to, resident, uh, to remedies? Um, residents, I already mentioned before. But in case persons have access to compensation, um, and they have uh, access to some money uh, and they have had some more support in the beginning. Of course, it's much easier for them to rebuild their lives uh, and to, to take the lives a little bit more in their hands. Moreover, what we see if people apply for compensation or maybe back wages, it also gives them the feeling that they can themselves uh, do something uh, in the process of bringing their traffickers to justice. And of course, compensation can gain them more financial uh, autonomy. Um, very shortly, because I think the next speaker will talk about it. If we talk about economic empowerment, of course, we mainly talk about uh, that people have access to employment, but also gain economic independence. Uh, and that's key for the mental well-being and the health. Uh, but also, um, yeah, as mentioned, um, uh, we see that um, very often for this economic uh, empowerment and reintegration programs, we see that traffic persons depend very much on the available access to regular integration programs that are set up by states or local communities. Very often this is decentralized. And also there we see a bottleneck. Sometimes NGOs are also not aware anymore what's happened with a person and can also not influence so much. However, our members of our platform, they support victims directly or indirectly in getting access to vocational training and enrolling in educational programs. Uh, they also work closely with specialized centers or a part of specialized support programs. Um, they, in cooperation with the national or local authorities, can facilitate the reinsertion, reinsertion of victims into the educational system or provide financial support for education. Again, this is far from easy. And we also um, uh, try to see, uh, to refer people to vocational programs of others. A major bottleneck that I want to mention is that often those vocational programs focus on basic skills and are not always in line with the basic persons need of focusing on a successful future. And they're very often generally limited in scope. And I'm more than sure that the WIND project uh, identified this. As for, um, as for the access to employment, one more thing next to the limited opportunities, what we also see is that many of the persons we assist, especially uh, if they come also from third countries outside Europe, uh, from Nigeria, for example, but also from other countries, they have hardly no access to physical documents, certificates, diplomas or letters of reference to evidence their experience and skills, which makes it very difficult to give them access to employment. And then, of course, there are a lot of other barriers that uh, create um, difficulties for people to enter the market, uh, especially also the competition, of course, if you have limited vocational training, education and limited work experience then of course it's already more difficult. So I would like to conclude with a, a few recommendations and I skipped a little bit of my presentation in for, the, for the sake of the time. Um, but yes, uh, I think it is very important that policies and strategies should be in place 
for successful inclusion of trafficked persons, including also their access to vocational training and job placements. Programs should focus much more on skill development, vocational training, but also include an assessment of the labor markets to ensure that we have a much more realistic job opportunities for trafficked persons and also include job counseling and preparation. There should be increased involvement of state employment agencies in job placement, but also the private sector should do much more. And one of the speakers already mentioned uh, the incentives that were given to the private sector to ensure that they um, yeah, create more uh, employment also for specific vulnerable groups. And that could be wage subsidies or, or other incentives. And lastly, I think there's much more need for strategic partnerships with organizations focusing on vocational training and job placements. Um, I leave it here and I hope there's still some time for questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you for these uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, I think one of the good sides of the um, uh, uh, WIND project is that uh, we, the consortium is built uh, from organizations that provide services, ecological and social services to victims of trafficking, uh, and other organizations that provide training and employment counseling for, to vulnerable people. So following one of the uh, recommendations. Uh, and now, uh, last but uh, not least, I would like to invite Mr. Tanasis Tairovolas uh, to share uh, his experience in implementation of a project which we consider as a sister project to win because it has uh, uh, it's targeting the same group of uh, women from third countries that were victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation. Uh, Tanasi Tairovolos is a researcher. He works in KMOP. This is an um, uh, organization, Greek organization in Athens. Uh, the full name is Social Action and Innovative Center. Uh, he holds a master's degree in Africa and international development, and he is an experienced project manager, researcher, and uh, project proposal drafter with more than six years of experience in the field. Uh, he has worked in different non-governmental organiza organizations in Greece dealing with migration issues, and he has uh, a research experience particularly on the intersection of migra migration and uh, gender issues. So, Tanasis, please. Thank you very much, Nadia, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, extremely interesting uh, uh, event. Thank you very much all uh, the speakers that have already um, shared with us um, rich uh, knowledge and, and great experiences. Um, so for the sake of time, I, I also am going to skip some uh, things you already mentioned, the Tolerant project. Uh, actually, my contribution today would be, will be based on, on the Tolerant project, uh, which was, as you said, a sister project uh, to win. Um, Tolerant uh, was implemented between 2019 and 2021. So it has just uh, been completed the last months. Uh, and of course, its objective like WIND was to enhance labor market integration of uh, victims of trafficking, specifically women, third country national um, victims of uh, sexual exploitation. So in, in the project, let me, let me share my screen. Uh, I have prepared um a presentation i guess you can see it so uh as i said uh um we were the leaders of the tolerant project together with other organizations like animus from bulgaria Cezi and differenza donna from italia adrum from romania and lifo from austria implemented this project and uh, I think uh, I would go straight to, to some of the key reflections from the implementation of the project. I would, I would like to share with you the challenges that we faced uh, during the project implementation, some good practices or some let's say uh, examples of good practices and some key uh, recommendations. And of course I would like to include in my presentation the actual impact of COVID uh, which I think we didn't really um, touch upon a lot today, 
uh, what was the impact of COVID, the, the impact of the pandemic for our service provision. Uh, so during the project implementation, as I said, we uh, had the chance to serve uh, more than 250 people, uh, victims of trafficking. Um, actually, it was 280 uh, in total. And they were coming from uh, very many different countries, more than 25 from, from the African continent, the Asian continent, or, or even the European continent. Um, let me show also uh, yeah, here. Um, the, the quantitative and qualitative data. Uh, the vast majority uh, of, of the victims of trafficking was, of course, uh, sexual exploitation, and some of them were both victims of sexual and labor exploitation. And the, of course, the type of identification, as you already said, most of you, uh, it was through informal ways, since we already have said that formal identification is, is missing, is lacking. Uh, the vast majority of the victims was uh, between 26 and, and 45 uh, years old, and to a lesser extent between 18 and 25. The legal status varied, uh, as we already said, uh, from asylum seekers, refugees, migrant visas, people, uh, victims were also undocumented, humanitarian status or residence permit or family reunification, taking advantage of the Dublin regulation. Uh, the education was also... Uh, uh, different in, in from basic education to university degree. And the services that we provided during these months were social counseling, legal counseling, language courses, um, tra trauma recovery, CV drafting, advice on labor market, communication with potential employers. And I'm very happy that you already raised this issue because also part of the project that we did, the tolerant one, was also raising awareness among uh, employers and sensitizing uh, the employer side. Um, so let's discuss um, some challenges that we faced during the project implementation. And I'm sure that some of them are common uh, and are uh, common for you and uh, uh, you face the same uh, in your context, but maybe some are different. Uh, first of all, it was really challenging for our field uh, professionals to sustain contact with the women engaged in the project on different levels, from building trust to following up uh, the case uh, to finding the person when we wanted to give uh, an, a follow-up advice or to refer to other services. Secondly, um, some beneficiaries were reluctant to engage with employability services since they experienced their residence in some countries as temporary. Uh, this has to do with migration and, and the journey and uh, we, saw, we saw it in Bulgaria and Romania, but also in Greece, that um, if they consider them as, as temporary, as transit countries, then they're uh, reluctant to engage uh, with finding a job because they want to continue their journey. Moreover, some of them, they were afraid to engage with public authorities, police, justice authorities, and of course, uh, this sometimes is justified uh, uh, on the basis of authorities' behavior. Uh, or stereotyping, or some of them were not willing to, to do so in order not to postpone again the continuation of their journey. We have already discussed a lot about the lack of legal documents and how this really um, is challenging for NGOs to provide services. So I'm not gonna elaborate more on this. Um, another challenge that we faced was uh, the means, the equipment, internet, laptops, tablets, so how we can communicate with the people, especially because of the pandemic, uh, how we can support them in accessing documents. Uh, and since these procedures sometimes are too lengthy and people get really demotivated during the process. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Teresa said, then they prefer maybe to stay uh, in, 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 let's say, in a position of undocumented and trying to find irregular jobs. Um, of course, there's a lack of employment opportunities for low skill profiles. And when we say lack of employment opportunities, we mean decent uh, employment opportunities. And of course, uh, we mean employment opportunities with social insurance, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lack of adequate language courses. Uh, so this means that although there are language courses that they are not enough, so people don't uh, learn the language of the country of the state. So that means that they have less chances to get a job. And of course, 
It was very challenging for us as a consortium to engage with the employers and sensitize them, since majority of them is not interested in um, uh, dealing with this issue. And let me now uh, discuss a few uh, things about the impact of um, COVID-19. Of course, most of the countries experienced lockdowns that had detrimental effects in, in terms of uh, referrals to services, in terms of access to resources, access to shelters. Uh, of course, COVID-19 um, increased the vulnerability and precarity uh, for victims of trafficking. And of course, that uh, led to an increase of the everyday challenges that they faced, leading to not having uh, finding a job as a first priority. Uh, there was a loss of jobs and other uh, of jobs in different sectors from hospitality sector, uh, uh, gastronomy, food, uh, food sector, etc. And of course, there were also less training opportunities. So that means uh, that we have a, a huge increase of inequalities. And that's, I think it's globally, as uh, the previous speakers have already said. Uh, there was unavailability of services, of course, due to the pandemic, or uh, there was this transition from the offline service provision to uh, an online service provision, which was also very problematic in many different ways. Um, how do you build trust with people uh, digitally? How, how do you make sure that people are safe when, when you provide the service while they are not in a safe place like the premises of an NGO? How do you make sure that they have a computer or an internet connection in order to um, receive the service. Then, of course, uh, NGOs and, and service providers uh, faced uh, the challenge to access reception centers due to COVID-19. Reception centers became closed facilities. Uh, entry exit was controlled. So this decreased the chances of uh, enhancing the proper identification and protection mechanism in these centers. Of course, we faced uh, beneficiaries dropping out from, from projects, from, from services. Um, and another thing that we didn't discuss was child, child care services is also very important. Many women have children, have minors, and they don't have access to child care service. So that means that they don't have the flexibility to take part in project activities or receive services. Um, and finally, I think, um, there was a, an overall negative impact, and I think that is documented in many reports, also from OCE, also from UN Women, also from many different institutions, that there was an overall negative impact on victims to access social and work reintegration paths. So if I can share uh, two, three examples of what we consider as good practices uh, during the project implementation was that some beneficiaries secured a job, uh, of course, in various sectors uh, like uh, we already discussed hospitality, food industry, um, Horeca exhibition. Some of them became cultural mediators in NGOs. Um, and some of them accessed uh, professional training courses uh, or internships. We also consider as, as a good example that we tried and we managed to reach existing employment agencies and associations working with and supporting employment integration of vulnerable people in general. So we tried to form coalitions. And finally, networking, uh, I think the multi-stakeholder approach was already, is already mentioned, and I think it's very important. We need to keep uh, working on that. So networking between different actors, covering the whole path uh, of, of reintegration, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, the individual projects of victims of trafficking are coordinated and more need monitored in a holistic way. Uh, finally, um, let me share also some uh, recommendations and lessons learned. I think um, Ms. Hoff has already mentioned some of them. Um, so we need to have uh, a more, uh, we need to put more effort on advocacy and lobbying to state authorities regarding the identification of, all, of victims of trafficking. We need to provide uh, a better social safety net for everyone so that no one is left behind. Uh, we need to design uh, a broader strategy, a more holistic, let's say, strategy of integration, engaging with all the relevant stakeholders, not the usual suspect. Um, of course, when I say uh, the relevant stakeholders, I mean also trade unions. It was also mentioned by other speakers, uh, NGOs, of course, migrants associations. Usually, uh, we don't uh, engage with them or we don't bring 
the migrant voices themselves on the, on the table, uh, public authorities, of course, national bodies, um, EU bodies, etc. Um, of course, there is a need for uh, further gender mainstreaming to all interventions. We should never, we should never uh, forget gender on our uh, approach. Um, personalized and gender sensitive job orientation and integration services. Uh, of course, we need to uh, improve the, the access to public and private services through the capacity building of, uh, of field professionals. Then, as Ms. Hoff uh, also suggested, we need to live from a perspective uh, of short-term interventions and go to a more medium and long-term programming, which would also facilitate the process of integration to labor market for victims of trafficking. And, and finally, we consider as very uh, necessary and important to have a participatory project designing and, and donor funding schemes uh, with a meaningful engagement of, of beneficiaries themselves. Um, of course, uh, we didn't have the time to uh, give you more information about the Tolerant Project, but what I'm planning to do is to send you in the chat the links of uh, the guide that we produced, which uh, we think that is very helpful for ser service providers. I would also share with you, of course, the website of the project where all materials are there and some policy recommendations that we uh, drafted after the final conference. You will find everything in the chat. And just a final uh, comment. Um, what we did during the Tolerant project was to also create a network. Uh, more than 25 members are in the Tolerant network. Um, the the purpose of the network is to exchange experience, ex exchange good practice, exchange knowledge, uh, form coalitions, um, support the effort of the actors in the field to uh, lobby and advo advocate towards the public authorities. So I will also share the link uh, in the chat of the Tolerant Network. And of course, uh, everyone is invited to check the link. And if you want to be part of this network, you can also uh, follow the instructions on how to join and we are really uh, looking forward to hearing from you and thank you very much uh, for, for inviting me and Nadia thank you very much for, for today. Thank you Tanasis. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the Tolerant Project and WIN Project are uh, working in the same perspective and a lot of our conclusions and findings are quite similar, which is uh, which is very good actually, because they're a base for uh, lobby and advocacy activities uh, based on practice. Now, now I would like to give you the floor for contributions and questions. Um, I see one here in the chat uh, from, uh, it's a contribution, it's from Etenesh Hadis. Please excuse me if I don't pronounce the name correctly. Uh, it's uh, a, 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 it's a, rep a representative from African Women's Organizations based in Austria. And it says that the, it, the employment opportunities for victims of trafficking are limited in many EU countries, depending on their residence permit visa uh, or other state. Uh, the rules differ from country to country, and um, we think that a unified labor law for the EU countries is important because this will avoid exploitation and misplacement, and it avoids frustration on immigrants and reduces social burden on countries. And also, the person is um, uh, advising for better represent uh, uh, representation of uh, migrant people and uh, uh, victims of trafficking in the decision-making processes. Uh, okay, so any questions to the speakers uh, in our second uh, panel? Uh, yes, Sonia, please. Sorry, I don't um, want to take uh, the, the floor, you know, too much, you know, do, uh, do the speakers want to answer or to add anything to the comment in the chat you know because i think it's quite important you know what mm -hmm. the the person is suggesting is to have uh, both sides so a 
government and immigration and victims of trafficking forum together, which mm -hmm. I think is quite uh, essential, you know, to solve the problem. I don't know whether anyone wants to comment on that, but you know, I I then you know have a number of questions as well to you know. Susanne, maybe you want to comment on this? Hey, please. Yes, sorry, I was lowering my hand and then immediately looking for the <laughs> uh, <laughs> unmute. Um, yeah, two things. Uh, yeah, I, I have never thought about this before, like um, a, a government immigrant and victims of trafficking forum together. It could be interesting in general, of course, um, in general, of course, we ask for traffic persons to be more involved in any kind of policies and measures taken, um, so their force is more heard. At the same time, and that's also sometimes an, an earlier spoke, speaker also spoke about the identification of uh, trafficked persons also by NGOs. We are, of course, very much involved in the initial process, um, but never in the formal identification of traffic uh, persons. And also here, um, yeah, there is a risk, not only for NGOs, but also for victims themselves who are in the forum, that they are associated with the ones who take the decisions, especially if the decisions are then negative. Uh, so yeah, it's difficult if you become, I would always say, stay independent and then you can critically watch and monitor. And, and that's also the bottlenecks we sometimes see with identification. I want to give one more reaction to this statement is that in general, we also of course ask for more harmonization. You saw it, some speakers already mentioned it. In some countries, uh, um, uh, there are different rules for who can access the uh, the, the labor market uh, and when uh, can it already be in your signing procedure. And also we see in general, there's a clear lack of um, employment op opportunities, especially also for low skilled migrants. Uh, I mean, the European Commission is currently working on a lot of different uh, legislations, um, also evaluating the victim directive, the trafficking directive, but also works on a new uh, migration and asylum uh, 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 plan. And you see already the biggest focus is again on return, and it's not on uh, enabling migrants uh, uh, to come to Europe and to work here, even though it's very much uh, identified and acknowledged by all that we lack uh, workers. You see that in the UK at the moment with the truck drivers, it's a big issue. Um, so yeah, it's a bit silly that uh, European countries do not realize that they better uh, open their markets more and then also ensure decent working conditions. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Well, Antoinette wants to raise a hand on the screen. Yes, um, for some reasons I don't have this uh, uh, electronic raise up hand here. Uh, I just, uh, I was wondering, uh, I often hear law enforcement and different authorities uh, talking about um, that uh, vulnerable people uh, may abuse uh, the support given as a victim of trafficking. And I was wondering, do you think that this type of thinking from the authorities may also prevent really effective policies and um, actions uh, towards uh, victims of trafficking, especially for third countries, because, you know, I hear from, from authorities here and there saying, oh, they pretend they're victims because they want to access the labor market or access some services that are provided to victims of trafficking. So this mistrust, what do you think? Is it is it giving a challenge? Is, is your question to uh, someone or to all the speakers? To all the speakers. <laughs> Okay. okay. Susan, do you want to start uh, or do you leave me the uh, burden? Uh, no, I, I'm more than happy to react, but Teresa, go first and I can add. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, actually, the mistrust uh, um, is true and the lies are true as well. And why? Because the system in itself is so rigid that we that it forces uh, vulnerable people to lie. And how uh, we have we have tons of examples of lies, uh, not only from victims of trafficking. We have asylum seekers who lie. Uh, if you go in the uh, on the website, uh, you find exactly 
uh, all the instructions on how to present uh, a good asylum request uh, in order to be uh, to be uh, considered. So it's it's you don't even need to go in the uh, you know dark web where a uh, tech uh, passport is one of the easiest ones to purchase, uh, and you purchase the overall identity in the dark web. So. Um, so the, the system in itself forces people to uh, to lie because there is no way for them to be recognized as migrant workers, as a person who is uh, trying to access uh, another opportunity in another in another country. You know, I I I could show you a slide in which that describes the power of a passport. If you have a Finnish passport, you can access some. 193 countries without a visa. Finnish, not the EU. The Finnish one is one of the most powerful passports in the world. But if you are unlucky and you have an Afghan passport, you cannot access even Pakistan, which is a bordering country. You need a visa to get into Pakistan. So, again, um, the people who need more to access opportunities abroad are the ones who are prevented the most from accessing those opportunities legally. This situation puts them in the factual, uh, de facto, they have to try to access the destination country in another way. So you have a lot of uh, lies of people requesting asylum, first of all. Uh, for victims of trafficking, well, it's, uh, I, 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 I heard this old story so many times uh, and uh, I would just uh, answer, do you know how much a um, prostitute earn every night? And then let's compare what a prostitute earns every night, a prostitute, not a victim of trafficking, a prostitute, free, uh, who can keep the money for herself and etc., or himself and, and etc., etc., and how much this person earns as a domestic worker. If, ju if you just compare, you would understand that it would be stupid. You would be stupid to try to become a domestic worker while he, as a prostitute you were you would earn much 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 more and this is also the reason why some victims of trafficking once they are legalized they have the residence permit they continue offering sexual services but in a free way in their homes um you know they keep some clients because some clients are affectionate clients so they are friends, they are good clients. Why should I renounce from this source of income? Okay, uh, I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm just a little bit pressing the discussion because we are quite over time. Suzanne, do you have anything to add to, to, to this? Uh, yeah, two ways. I, although I agree partly with what Teresa said, in, in particular also the beginning of the systematic situation and that people are somehow forced into the situation also to, to lie in certain cases. I would at the same time say we see it's a bit funny because at the same time the states all the time say, and actually also again they blame then the victim, it's that they say the victim don't come forward. And I think for both reasons is there's actually no access to much support and guarantee. So even if you report, you don't know. I mean, we see all over Europe, people with a Dublin claim. Uh, I mean, in the end, you are returned. You are even told, go back to Italy and report there. So um, I, th I think the, 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 the comments, we hear them in the Netherlands too. It's a bit odd. Secondly, if you look at the amount of people that are identified, it's, it's in particular odd. Also looking at Bulgaria, I think there's hardly any case of a third country national uh, uh, for which a perpetrator has been <laughs> prosecuted. They have no cases. Uh, most of the cases they deal with in Bulgaria are still the ones that return from other countries and have been exploited mm -hmm. there. So I think, uh, yeah, if you look at the, f the small amount of people that they are actually accesses, and that's also why I doubt sometimes about the high estimations. I mean, in, in practice, governments don't want to assist all the presumed traffic persons because they also already don't want to give the rights to those that are clearly uh, trafficked persons. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure. <laughs> I hope. Thank you. And last for maybe Sonia, because we are 
really quite a lot uh, over time. Uh, do you have a question or contribution? Yeah, I actually want to say that, um, yeah, I mean, the, the panel is, uh, is quite interesting in looking at what are the causes for human trafficking. And, uh, um, and so obviously I share, you know, what uh, Teresa was saying about, uh, we should really have legal venues for people to come to Europe rather than uh, make, make, you know, those illegal or irregular um, ways uh, of coming. So I see at points of, you know, trying to legalize, you know, the more, so let's uh, shift the, the debate, you know, towards, instead of focusing on uh, trafficking towards a sort of a more, sort of a broader debate where we talk about legal venues available, so visas available. Uh, and I also see the Su Susanna's point, you know, about um, the issue of uh, lying and also, you know, Teresa's points, you know, but we all lie at some point. You know, I have to lie with the GP in the UK and say that, you know, my headache is not just a, a temporary one because otherwise my GP won't see me. So if you don't exaggerate the situation, if you don't somehow, you know, make sure that you are seen, obviously you are unseen and therefore, you know, unidentified and therefore, you know, you can really be protected. And I also agree with Suzanne that, you know, somehow the reflection period, the so-called reflection period is just 30 days. And what do you have in the 30 days? You know, you have to, you have nothing. You don't have le legal residence. You actually are covered for a period of 30 days. You might have some support, but then you have to start the international protection procedure to have, you know, legal residence. So even, you know, saying that you are a victim of trafficking sometimes, you know, it doesn't really give you a lot, particularly if you are not aware that you are a victim because you know as uh, also uh, Teresa was suggesting sometimes you know the the line between the prostitution and being a victim is very blur because you might actually feel well I'm doing something wrong because I'm doing I'm I'm, I'm doing this you don't really realize that there is a sexual exploitation and that your passport is not with you, for instance, and you are forced you know, to have a very limited amount of money. And you feel you are obviously illegal because, and you can't really go to the police you know, to denounce the situation. So it's a, sort of a verse, um, um, it's, it's a sort of a situation where you are trapped within the rules and are, are trapped within the working of the rules. And sometimes even getting the recognition could actually take, you know, different venues. So for instance, you know, there is a, a famous case of, uh, it's called Yonga case versus Halleng, is a UK case where this lady, this Nigerian lady came to the UK when she was minor on a um, false visa. So the visa was, uh, was just simple, a touristic visa. And she was working for a Nigerian family and in the end, you know, she was exploited, it was a forced labor, so she was just as domestic, within the domestic, um, obviously, home. Um, she was exploited, and in the end, you know, she realized that, you know, uh, she was kicked out of the house, and then, you know, with the help of some NGOs, she started a legal proceeding. But the legal proceeding started at the level of the uh, employment tribunal, so they were not really questioning the fact that she was a victim, they were questioning the fact, you know, that their, their contract of employment was void. So she managed to show that she was a victim of trafficking at the level of the Supreme Court. So can you imagine, you know, from the first layer of the judgment, you know, the Supreme Court layer is where she was recognized as a victim. So even you know, this complexity of the, the, the issues, just even, you know, the, the place where you start your identification or even legally, you know, through the courts, you know, might take you ages and years. And, and therefore, you know, somehow it's better not to, um, to tell anything or yeah. to hide. And, and another question, you know, I had, you know, about the Tolerant Project that I found uh, extremely interesting. I'm sure that is a uh, yeah, very, please, very uh, short question uh, and sorry. very short answer because uh, we are really over time quite well, but yeah, very short question. No, I was actually saying that, you know, the, um, the sign and the elements that you've noticed, you know, so some, some, some of the problems, you know, that the victims had, um, I found, you know, that those um, were a sort of, uh, I, I believe they are actually generalized 
elements. So they don't just apply maybe to victims of trafficking. They cannot potentially apply to regular migrants as well or to any other migrants. So I wonder whether in your project you found something which is peculiar and can um, single out, and actually this is extended to the whole um, wind project as well, so it can single out, you know, the victim of trafficking and whether, you know, there is any challenge that relates to that particular person, because, you know, potentially the legal obstacles or, you know, the language element or yeah. the issue about the CV, you know, that they don't know how to draft a CV could be potentially be the same, you know, for all migrants, not just for victims of trafficking. So I wonder, you know, whether there was any element. Uh, that, that, are you going yeah. to answer? Uh, I can say just one thing quickly. Um, I think the um, psychosocial conditions maybe are different. Trauma. Because, trauma. yeah, the trauma recovery and, and uh, the issue of exploitation, I think this is a differentiated variable that you cannot find maybe in other. Of course, other migrants can be oppressed, can be marginalized, can be at risk of exploitation. So, of course, as you said, it could be a common experience, but I think uh, having... Uh, faced uh, maybe sexual exploitation uh, it has more traumas I mean it's also a bodily expression of, of the trauma so I think it's it's a bit uh, different yeah that aspect okay now now I really will be the bad guy and I have to stop this very <laughs> interesting discussion uh, because we are quite uh, over time we will continue in the next session maybe uh, uh, you will uh, find some aspects uh, of uh, uh, as answers of your questions when we will uh, present you directly uh, the results, achievements, and, and lessons learned in the WIND project. Now it is uh, uh, 22, 22 to 1 uh, Central European time, and I suggest that we have a 20 minute of a break and we gather together back at one o'clock. Yes, is it time for everybody? We will continue at one o'clock, yes? So you can, don't leave the meeting, don't switch off the uh, link, just uh, switch off your cameras and mute your microphones and in 20 minutes we will be back. Nadia? Yeah. May I just say thank you very much for the invitation. It was a real pleasure to be present and to be part of this really lively and excellent discussion. I have to leave you for the last uh, part, unfortunately, because I have other um, meetings to attend. But I, I, one thing that really uh, makes me happy is that I see that there are uh, people motivated to do what they can to save victims of trafficking. And this gave me really <laughs> um, good feeling from, for the future. Thank you to all. Thank you, Antoinette. Thank you. Bye. Hello. Yeah, we are back. Hello. Hello. Maybe a few minutes and we can start. <clears throat> Nadia, yeah. do we have uh, until two o'clock? I think we will be uh, a little bit later. Oh ah, yeah, until two o'clock. Yeah. Yes, because we were going to finish at half past one, and I think yeah, yeah. like yeah. minutes later. Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
Congratulations Thank you. for the panelists. It's been great to hear all, all the speakers. Very interesting. Yeah. Maybe we can start because okay. we're already behind the agenda. Yeah. Nadia, how, how should we proceed? Do do I directly introduce the last panel? Yes. Yes. yes, you directly? Yeah. Okay. I'm switching off my Okay, good afternoon. Welcome again. Welcome to the last part of the of this international conference on labor integration of women victims of trafficking from third countries tackling multiple vulnerabilities. Where it's my it is my pleasure to introduce the last panel on capitalization and outcomes of the Win project, together with my friends and partners from the Fondo Provinciale Milanese per la Cooperazione Internazionale, Animus Association Foundation, Lule and Energia Empresa Sociale. Okay, we will start with Valeria Cuerzola from the F. Uh, oh, we have some minutes at the end as in the previous panel for comments and questions. And then I go, okay, we will start with Valeria Cuerzola uh, for, from the FPMCI uh, that will introduce the main goals and, and the structure of the capitalization paper. paper. Dear Valeria, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. So, and also thank you all the panelists and the, the beautiful, interesting discussion before the, the break. It was really, really, really interesting <laughs> and stimulating. So, yes, I would like to introduce the capitalization document. It is the final document of the project. Um, I cannot say that is the, the most important. I mean, all the documents produced by our project is, are important, but it is really the conclusion, a good conclusion of, uh, uh, of our work. Um, I think it's uh, easy to show you the uh, table of content of the, of the document. Uh, by the way, the document is at the moment in English and um, the translation into Italian, Spanish, and the Bulgarian uh, is underway. Uh, after our meeting, we will uh, then uh, disseminate our, our event. Uh, we will disseminate it. We will send the document to all the participants, uh, together with the link to the video that we showed at the beginning of the of the of the conference. So I will uh, um, share my screen with the, the table of content. Okay, so this is the uh, programmatic document for the capitalization of the result of the WIN project. The aim, I can say the aim of the document is uh, uh, to share, simply to share the result of the WIN project. Uh, it is based on the information collected by the project partners, including feedback from the beneficiaries related to the project. The, before uh, showing the, the, the table of content, I would like just to, uh, to, to tell you which, are, which, are the, which is the audience of the, the target audience of the document. The document is main, mainly addressed to uh, an heterogeneous audience. It is uh, civil society organizations working with victims of trafficking, migration and asylum organizations, human rights and women's rights organizations, training and employment service providers, trade unions and professional associations, business community, including social cooperatives, policy makers, and the general public. As you can see from the table of content, The document consists in the first part about the purpose of the document. This is uh, the aim that I've just uh, uh, explained to you and the target audience. It goes through the objective of the WIN project and the scope. Um, it analyzes the context 
uh, of in Spain, Bulgaria, and Italy, and the impact of COVID-19 to the, the project and to the traffic of women in general. The main activities and the conclusions. The conclusion including the main results and, very important, all the lessons learned and recommendations for future interventions. Uh, I leave the now. I leave the floor to uh, to my colleague uh, from my from uh, our uh, partners to uh, to explain uh, to go into details of the capitalization document. Thank you, Vanessa. It's uh, your turn to present. Thank you very much, Valeria. Uh, continuing with the order of our program, in the second place, uh, we will have uh, Martina, Martina Giorgetti from LULE that will present the context uh, and the needs of the third national traffic at women uh, we work with in the project. Dear Martina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you to all. Uh, first of all, uh, I um, must say that for LULE, it was the first experience with a, within a European project and it was a great occasion for us, uh, a great opportunity to compare and to enrich ourselves. Um, I present a snapshot of the startup of this project, talking about the women that we have taken in charge and about their needs encountered in all the countries that participated to the project, which are Italy, Spain, and Bulgaria. Um, let's share my few slides of presentation. Can you see them? Okay. Um, yes. yes, perfect. Okay. The beneficiaries of this project were identified by uh, uh, the anti-trafficking bodies and association of all of the three countries uh, involved. Uh, and uh, as uh, before said, there were, um, they were uh, Lule for uh, Italy, Amiga for Spain and Animus for Bulgaria. All the women taken in, cha in, in charge had to meet some requirements to participate to the project. Uh, first of all, they had to be uh, third country nationals, victims, or potential victims of uh, traffic for sexual uh, uh, exploitment. Uh, they had to be in possession or waiting for regular uh, residence permits. Uh, they had to have a minimum knowledge of the language of the country of destination in order to participate, uh, to, 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 to attend all the preparatory courses for work that we proposed and uh, uh, they had to be willing to remain in the same country for the entire duration of the project that was of two years. Let's focus a bit uh, on the context of the different countries. Um, in Spain, what about Spain? Uh, Spain continues to be uh, mainly a country of destination for trafficked people together with uh, a country of uh, transit. Um, the regular uh, immigration, as we have already said during this um, event is very vulnerable to trafficking. In particular, uh, um, the Nigerian uh, criminal, uh, criminal networks uh, work on the territory, recruiting victims within uh, the country borders, but also outside uh, of uh, Spain um, borders, for example, uh, recruiting uh, women, women and people in uh, reception centers in Italy, and then forcing them to prostitution in Spain. The legal framework of trafficking in Spain consists of a criminal code uh, comprehensive of uh, also of children protection. Uh, new rights and measures for uh, the victims have been issued, including uh, recognizing, tra recognizing trafficking for sexual purposes as a form of sexual violence. 
Spanish law neither uh, uh, permits nor prohibits prostitution, but many NGOs believe that uh, the majority of women in prostitution in Spain are trafficked. Uh, the Spanish Supreme Court is moving towards uh, issuing new sanctions um, against uh, trafficking uh, or, uh, and for offering sexual services in public. And Spain has a national action plan to combat trafficking for sexual ex exploitation. A bit different is the situation in Bulgaria, that is first uh, a country of origin for trafficked people, uh, secondly a transit country and all, all in few cases a country of destination. Differently from the other two countries, uh, so it's a temporary spot mainly for uh, trafficked people. There is also a disproportion be between the men and women in the, in the migrant flows, uh, and in fact only one uh, over six uh, of um, migrants are women. Uh, moreover, there are no officially, uh, there is not, not an official uh, system of uh, identification for victims and uh, for refugees. Uh, on one hand, because authorities are not proactive in this direction, and uh, on the other hand, because uh, migrants are very scared of deportation and uh, of the risk of uh, postponing their travel. Our Bulgarian colleagues uh, told us during the duration of the project that these factors create many challenges when working on the socioeconomic integration of trafficked women. All the victims, all the women victims of trafficking uh, have been identified informally by NGOs like um, Animus uh, and NGOs uh, which um, deal, for example, with um, against violence. Uh, there are no progresses in combating the uh, trafficking of human beings on the territory, although there are uh, annual national, national programs. Uh, about Italy, uh, Italy continues to be the primary destination country for trafficked people. Uh, the majority of them are female, but we can find also men, trans people and children. Due to its position, Italy is um, a country of arrival of a massive number also of asylum seekers. Uh, Greta report uh, have noticed how Italy has taken uh, many steps forward uh, to combat trafficking through legislation and through the setting up uh, of uh, many assistance and social integration projects. Uh, important has been the role and is the role played by the Department for Equal Opportunities, uh, but it's, ne it's necessary to strengthen the, inst the institutional framework uh, um, for action against um, traffic of human beings uh, and to coordinate uh, uh, public bodies and civil society. Since 2016, the Ministry for Equal Opportunities elaborated uh, an anti-trafficking national plan to contrast and repress uh, crime and to protect victims. The recipients of this project were uh, 62 women. Italy counted 15, in Spain uh, we found 21, and in Bulgaria 26. Uh, in Italy, 100% of them were from Nigeria, while in Spain, uh, the 33% of them came from Nigeria and uh, the rest from uh, Latin America for uh, the 60% and from other countries in the Maghreb Belt for the 10%. Uh, regarding women in, uh, involved in the project in Bulgaria, uh, around 28% came from Iran, around 18% from Syria, and the rest from different countries, including Afghanistan, Lebanon, and Colombia. The age of the women included in the project um, was uh, for Italy from 20 to 32, in Spain from 18 to 46, and in Bulgaria from 21 to 61. Um, we can make a focus uh, on the COVID situation that we had to face uh, during the implement of the project because it had a strong impact uh, uh, on trafficking of people. On one hand, hand, border and street police presence was increased and this fact seemed to dissuade a bit crime. But on the opposite hand, criminals started adapting their business model to the new normal created by the pandemic, above all through technologies. 
At the same time, um, the pandemic impacts the capacity of the state and of, uh, of the organizations to provide essential services to the victims. Uh, and the situation led to an increase of vulnerability to conditions of people. Um, about the implement of this project, uh, the confinement measures adopted by all the governments to protect the public health uh, caused additional difficulties for each one of the participants' country. First of all, because of the intensity of isolation of some of the beneficiaries, um, and uh, secondly, for the impossibility uh, to meet up. Moreover, the COVID crisis uh, um, impacts uh, the possibility of survivors uh, uh, to obtain uh, um, an easy socioeconomic uh, reintegration because of the lack uh, of the work. Um, about the instrument used, uh, in the project, uh, we speak um, about this uh, personal integration plan, PIP, uh, which every beneficiary received uh, to assess uh, and register the background, their skills were made using two different techniques. On one hand, uh, individual interviews uh, using a questionnaire developed uh, with common guidelines uh, among all the associations. And uh, on the second hand, uh, we use creative and recreational labs um, organized by Animus and Lule uh, to observe um, trafficked women technical and social skills, including uh, the improvement of positive group dynamics among them. The aim of the individual interviews was to assess uh, these following aspects. Uh, the background level of education of the, victim, of the victims, uh, their personal skills, uh, their level uh, of language of the destination country, their professional needs and expectation, their, their professional interests and objectives, uh, and their training needs. Complementary assessments was, uh, were carried out uh, and uh, we focused on uh, psychological and legal uh, needs. Uh, information assets by, assessed by individual interviews uh, and work groups. Um, about the situation of the three countries, uh, we can notice that in Spain, Amiga uh, didn't conduct formal interviews because, uh, because only two, women's, uh, two women declared to have uh, psychological needs, uh, but they were already covered by their uh, association of uh, provenience. Uh, about the legal situation, quite all of the participants uh, had a stable document situation. In Bulgaria, Animus identified uh, uh, quite most of the beneficiaries for psychological and legal support. And also in Italy, Lula identified psychological need for uh, almost all the participants. Um, and in fact, almost all of the participants decided to continue beyond the first uh, psychological interviews. And uh, about the legal support, uh, the support was carried out for um, all the women of the, included in the project, uh, which received uh, courses on civic education and orientation to territory, in which they could also discuss and ask questions about their personal uh, legal issues. The assessment conclusion led to the elaboration of these um, personal integration plans for each beneficiary, and every uh, PIP was uh, implemented with the, in the presence and with the help uh, of every woman uh, using the PIP templates. Uh, the PIP includes uh, individual needs assessment, individual objective, and then the plan to reach uh, uh, the objectives. Um, uh, declared by the beneficiaries and discussed together. Uh, the framework for the implementation uh, of the activities uh, um, was carried out referring to the educational and the employment services, uh, while the psychological and the legal support uh, um, remained the complementary activities. <laughs> I think I can. Conclude. Is that all? Have you finished? Martina? Yeah. OK, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. OK, now we have um, um, our next speakers. Are the
Okay. Ah, okay. Our next speakers are going to be Kalina Petkova and Alexandra Nalvantova from Animals Association Foundation that will present the integration activities relevant to the context and the needs of the trafficked women. Dear Kalina and Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just a second to share our... Yes. Um, yeah, I got it. Um, well, first of all, it is honestly a pleasure yeah. um, to be here amongst all of you and a privilege. Um, we are Kalina and Alexandra. Uh -huh. and was, yeah. I'm supervising Nadia. Yeah, and we uh, um, and to, yeah. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the implementation monitoring um, and uh, <clears throat> updating of, of the PIPs. Mm -hmm. um, basically, after the very important part of mapping this and assessing um, the beneficiaries' backgrounds, skills, wants, as well as their psychological and legal and socioeconomic needs, uh, came the um, implementation of, of the project. Uh, which uh, was hap would happen through uh, the different services provided. Mm -hmm. uh, we will go into more detail about the different services um, in a little bit. Um, however, uh, when it comes to the monitoring, um, it is important to say uh, how that was done. And it was done using a multitude of techniques. Um, of course, we had, uh, uh, there was an observation of the group processes mm -hmm. in each country. Um, after which uh, we the <clears throat> uh, the, benef the beneficiaries would be contacted, whether via calls, emails, or like individual calls, individual meetings, uh, whether online or live, depending on the situation uh, with the pandemic and whether it allows for live contact. Um, after um, after all of this, uh, we would discuss all of us. Um, discuss, share um, on both a national level uh, and on an international level, our findings, the findings would be discussed. Um, and um, first in each individual country, then by the consortium um, to determine actually what needed to be updated, what needed to be improved and how the PIPs and um, project had to um, adapt basically mm -hmm. to both the situation right now, uh, both the environment, including of course COVID-19, uh, which made quite the difference, an unexpected difference, as well as um, the situation and the needs of the women, of the beneficiaries themselves, mm -hmm. because they would um, naturally change and evolve through time. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, yeah, the, yeah. the two levels of the military. And now uh, we are uh, going to speak a little bit about the different parts of uh, services. Um, how the colleagues said the, the approach is holistic and contains different services. And uh, first we're going to speak a little bit, a bit about them and then we uh speak about that about the exactly that is and uh how many women uh take part of the in the services yes as you can see um uh, we have a uh, training and courses jobs placement services language services legal uh psychological service social and educational and also mediational and yeah. it was very important for like in most cases in most beneficiaries according to our observations at least, um, really all or most of these services were necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, we really, uh, a, a holistic approach, an approach that um, uh, looks at the individual on multiple levels, looks at their needs um, and skills that even on, a, on different levels was vital, was crucial mm -hmm. to determine, to, to, to succeed in our mission. Yes. Let's take a look at okay. Um, okay. Yes, uh, we can. Uh, we now would like to take a little bit of time to just concentrate on it. just just for a little bit to concentrate on the different mm -hmm. the different services provided. After which, as my colleague said, we would go into the statistic. Basically, mm -hmm. we'll go into 
uh, more detail about what happened in each uh, country. Um, of course, the training and courses um, that is a very important part, um, and they include both transversal and professional courses that were included. Um, uh, the transversal co courses are basically um, courses for basic skills. Uh, basic skills useful for socioeconomic integration, basic skills um, needed for, for finding a job, for looking for a job, and so forth, um, which unfortunately many of the beneficiaries would need very much since they would have very little experience with the job market, very little to none, mm -hmm. uh, very little to none experience with um, all of these things like writing a CV, even like little all of these aspects of basically looking for a job as well as keeping a job. Um, of course, uh, there have been professional trainings um, as well, uh, which would be for, um, for specific skills, for specific, uh, like this time it's more, more about, um, it, it, more, it depends more on the aim and the desire of the, of the beneficiary mm -hmm. of, of their interests. And basically, um, depending on what we determined in the PIPs, uh, would be the best course of action and the best um, the best um, strategy mm -hmm. to 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 help uh, the beneficiaries and to support them to in, to reach their goals. Basically, um, they were different uh, professional courses, as you maybe know, like, for, for example, for computer skills and, and so on. <clears throat> Alexandra, you're... Yes, it seems that we have... Job placement like, service oh, oh, that Alexa, provides Alexandra, uh, employment service. Ale yeah, Alexandra, you have uh, a problem with, yeah, the, with the microphone. Here is better? Yeah. No, the microphone is okay. Can but we it? can't hear you. We can't hear you. No? Uh, uh, yeah, just for a second. Let's, let's just... Uh, yeah. Now it's fine. Now yeah, it's, it's fine. fine. Go yeah. on. It, it is okay. Is it better? It is better? Yes, now it's fine. Yes. Okay. No, okay. We, we'll just do it now. Okay. Uh, I just said that the another serv uh, service is the job uh, pl placement service that provides uh, employment service, of course. Uh, the support was in, in a specific way, like uh, um, write a CV cover letter or preparing for interviews, also scouting to um, different uh, jobs opportunities and contacts uh, and job searching channels. Um, the another part was uh, entrepreneurships or preparing the clients who are interested to make their own Oh, it's a bit difficult we have. Yeah, Alexandra, can you come to take part of it? Can you come to my what? office maybe to continue or just very shortly because if there is something wrong with the connection there oh okay okay just yeah we'll, we'll... Yeah, I, I i think you could just go to the figures at the end because it's already too much time and... oh we don't have time no yeah what should we should we try one more time from here maybe okay yeah okay uh well, okay i'm gonna go like super super fast uh through the rest of the services the training courses in the job placement, obviously, they yeah. kind of all complement each other. Uh, of course, we provided language services, which, as you can all imagine, uh, were crucial. Um, it's very hard to find uh, a job for somebody who has very little understanding of the native language. Believe us, we've tried. It's very hard. Um, of course, ecological services regarding yes. strengths, weaknesses, mm -hmm. resources, and issues um, that the beneficiaries yeah. would have, as well as Sometimes they would need to share traumatic experiences or painful experiences that have happened to them, um, as well as anxieties and frustrations connected with COVID-19 mm -hmm. or connected with the personal lives um, of, of the beneficiaries. Um, of course, legal services were crucial as well, 
as you can imagine, um, they were mostly concentrated on uh, the beneficiaries obtaining their legal status or keeping a legal status, um, which um, <clears throat> of course um, is a vital, vital part of their integration. Without that, we can't do okay, anything. Other problems with the housing and works and yeah, of right. Course. In, yeah, in that field. Yeah. yeah. Basically, basically, what we discovered mm -hmm. um, is that it is very hard to mm -hmm. um, to uh, to encourage a woman to work on uh, on her socioeconomic integration, basically, when uh, many of her even like, uh, physiological mm -hmm. needs have not been met, yeah. uh, which is why here we have displayed for you the uh, pyramid of the hierarchy of Maslow, mm -hmm. which you might or might not be familiar mm -hmm. with. But here, as you can see, um, it, 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 I think it, it. I think it illustrates what we're trying to say very well. Yeah. self actualization which is basically what we are aiming to support mm -hmm. women in, is just the, the the tip of the iceberg. And it is very hard to support somebody uh, in thinking about their like improving their language skills or improving their professional skills when they have serious yeah. issues with housing, with their legal status, yeah. with um, living below the yeah. poverty line in many cases, and so on and so on. And I think that this was um, a big part of, of the fact, <clears throat> a big part of the reason why um, some of the women had difficulty staying in mm -hmm. the project, had difficulty um, resuming their work. And, yeah, there was and so constant, on. yeah, the contact. Uh, uh, because we are very limited of time, I, I suggest that you go and just show the table with the numbers. Sure. So, yeah, okay. yeah I, of course. Yeah. Okay, as you can see here, are the numbers and uh, about the, the beneficiaries, and, and we just uh, uh, we can say just in general, in total, in the three countries, there was a uh, four transversal trainings and mm -hmm. ten professionals trainings. Mm -hmm. Uh, in uh, shame the because we have so serious uh, technical thing. problems with with the speech. I don't know. Um, Maybe I can take uh, <laughs> uh, from you. Uh, yeah, uh, I think so. uh, Dear Alexandra, please and 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 Kalina, Kalina and Alexandra, okay. please. Uh, I, I'm really sorry, but we really need to finish this presentation and we are having technical problems. Would you mind if Nadia maybe can, uh, Nadia, I, are you ready? I, I, just, uh, I will just okay. finish that. We are very proud that in the whole project, we work with 62 women. You know, if you can see in the countries, uh, how, how, how many of them were engaged in the uh, personal identification plans. We're very happy that at the end, uh, 24 women were employed in all of the countries that um, also uh, a lot of women had uh, language courses organized by the project or referred and, uh, uh, to, to language courses and paid by, by the project. 27 women received legal counseling in Bulgaria. One woman was also presented into, into court. Uh, Majority of women, more than half, had uh, psychological support and uh, psychological counseling. All of the women actually received, in one or another way, social or educational support. I would like to emphasize that uh, uh, labor integration, social economical integration, was not possible if not basic safety and security was um, achieved through our social and uh, educational support. And most of the women. Uh, were helped with mediation in their integration process. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Nadia, and thank you very much. And I'm really sorry, Alexandra and Kalina. Okay, let's. Uh, uh, we are going to introduce uh, uh, Hortensia. I'm going to give the floor one one second, one minute one to Valeria. Uh, yes. Uh, and then we will continue with the presentation of the la of the presentations of this last panel. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I would like just one, just a few seconds uh, to welcome uh, uh, Hortensia Vélez, uh, who is uh, our AMIF project officer, who follow us and support us during the, the whole project implementation. So thank you for participating, even if you are just uh, uh, arrived. 
So the first part was about the, uh, yeah, there were panel discussion, very interesting panel discussions, and now, but now we are discussing and going into the case of our capitalization document for things. I think you will find it very, uh, very uh, interesting. Um, I just uh, take uh, advantage of this uh, to, to say that uh, I have to run away in uh, like, I, I'm already with a delay. Uh, so uh, Nadia uh, will, um, will uh, close the, uh, the conference uh, instead of me. So uh, thank you. I thank you now for your participation. You are excused. You are very much excused. In yeah, yeah. Situation. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have a special situation. Yeah, <laughs> and okay. I have to go. Yeah. All the best. Thank you very much, you. Valeria, and welcome, Hortensia. We are very pleased to have you here with all of us. And now is the turn for Julia Hispano from Energia that is going to talk about the satisfaction survey and awareness raising activities that have been that have taken place um, within the WIND project. Uh, the floor is yours, dear Julia. Thank you, Vanessa. Yes, I will now present the results of two additional activities carried out within the WIND project. The first activity is the submission of a satisfaction questionnaire to the trafficked women engaged in the personal integration plans in the three countries involved. The same questionnaire has been submitting during inter individual interview two times at the halfway and at the end of the project. These activities was included in the project design in order to gather feedback from the beneficiaries about the services provided and to involve them in the evaluation of the project. It also reveals to be a, an opportunity for the women to reflect on the path taken over the two years, on the goals achieved and the issues to work on. Just a second, I will share my screen, my presentation. Okay, we will now go quickly to the question of the surveys. I will not present them, I will only present the most representative data, but you will find all the data in the capitalization document, which will be distributed to participants. In general, we had very positive feedback in all the countries from the women who answered to the surveys. And as you can see in the slides, we have more positive feedback in the second round compared with the first one. If you look, for example, at the question, during the interviews, did you understand what was being proposed to you? Or the question, did you find the interviews useful? You can see that in the first round, about half of the women in Bulgaria and few women in Italy answered partially. And in the end, the 100% of the women in all the three countries answered yes. One of the reasons is that some services were not completely provided at half weight of the project. But the most interesting reason is that the women, especially in Bulgaria, do not have the habit to participate in such project and to be interviewed, which means that sometimes they have difficulties in understanding what they are being asked and why, and to think of, think of themselves as agents of their own lives. Most women indeed we were very surprised that we were asking them about their plans and how they see their future or if they felt comfortable with us. Therefore, we believe that the differences in the answers of the second round compared with the first one is also a positive effect of the work with them during the project and of the increasing of their skills and self-confidence, which can be considered another important result achieved by the project. You can see the same trend in Bulgaria in the question help, to help you to focus your personal goals. In Italy, we did not repeat the question in the second round. The question of the Greek goals, how many do you think you reach? Most of the women at the end of the project reply, some of them, and no one replied none, which means that the project contributes to reach personal objectives for all the women, but there are still some goals to work on. This is understandable because the question can be interpreted also as related to long-term objectives, such as stable jobs, financial independence, autonomous housing. 
You don't have the graphic in the slide, but another fundamental response for us, especially given what the women suffered in their life, is that all women in all the countries felt comfortable with us during the activities. About the level of satisfaction of the different services offered within the project, all the women, with the exception of some few women in Bulgaria, had a good level of satisfaction about the educational and social support, the employment services, the training courses, and the legal support. Concerning the psychological support, instead, it's in Italy that the most of the women answer it good, but we have one woman who considered the service sufficient and two women who consider it insufficient. Finally, all the women in all the countries will recommend the project to the friend. We do their really positive comments in all the countries that make us very satisfied about the achievements and also touched about women's gratitude. Here you can read some of the comments. In general, the women were very thankful for the support provided. And some women in all the countries would have liked the project to continue. Another question was if there was anything in particular that interested them. The answer were mainly in the training courses in general and some specific courses, the internships and the support in finding and maintaining a job, which of course are for them a priority, but also the psychological, legal and educational support. Finally, some of the women gave us also important advices about missing activities or something they will do differently to be considered in the design of a future project. This includes a longer project, more courses, financial support for, the, for essential expenses and social security contributions, having separate groups with a more homogeneous level and including beneficiaries that are not third country nationals. We move now. Now, another project activity, which is the running of the awareness raising action targeting the business community, training and employment services provider, trade unions, and professional association. The consortium developed a common material to be presented during national events organized in the three countries. The material has been translated in the national language and adapted to the local context and is public, so it's av available for everybody. And the Eight people participated in the event in Spain, 48 in Italy, and 13 in Bulgaria. Different actors attended the event, including representatives from the business community, social cooperatives, employment agencies, training providers, civil society and social organizations, public institutions, and different professional freelance. Fortunately, the participation has been less than expected, particularly in Bulgaria, and in general from the business community, due probably to the pandemic situation. The main topic presented and discussed in a fruitful debate with participants were the features of trafficking and characteristics of victims at the EU and national level, the European and national legal framework, the national protection programs for victims, the challenges, challenges about job inclusion and the best practices and different ways of overcoming obstacles. Finally, the concrete action that employers and training and employment services provider can undertake to contribute to labor integration of trafficked women. Some employers engaged in offering internship and job opportunities were invited to testify their experience and also based on the feedbacks received from participants in the satisfaction survey submitted to them, we believe that it was very useful to hear their voice to increase the social responsibility of more enterprises as key actor of the labor integration of third country national women. Nigerian women, not part of the project, but which was hired by one of these companies, was also invited to give a speech. Why not part of the project? And here I answer also to, to some previous comment from the public who recommended the involvement of women victim and also during this event. The involvement, the involvement of victims is very important, but it's also delicate. 
because it's not easy for them, also given the trauma, traumas they suffer to appear in public and to be presented or present themselves as victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation, which is a very sensitive data. Coming back to the awareness raising action, a lot of participants declare that they were little acquainted with trafficking before the meeting and they increased their knowledge. In addition to the organization of these events, in all the three countries, we have run several types of actions aimed at promoting the project and increase awareness among stakeholders, not only the ones mentioned before, more related to the work environment, but also civil society organization working with trafficked people, migrants, asylum seekers and refugees, as well as public authorities and policymakers. These actions include social media campaigns, interview place in media, including radios and televisions, podcasts, participation in targeted events on trafficking or other related topics, distribution of project flyers, organization of final national events to present the project result, the lesson learned, good practice and recommendation. And finally, the creation and dissemination of the awareness raising video show at the beginning of this conference, which is at your disposal with subtitles available in English, Spanish, Italian and Bulgarian, and can be used by all the entities working on the fight against trafficking and the support to victims. Thank you for your attention. I leave the floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Julia. Okay, and now is my turn and it is my pleasure to talk about the lessons learned during the WIN project and the shared final conclusions about it. Um, um, I, I, I was thinking to start about uh, talking about the differences among the countries, but, but as uh, Martina has talked about this before, I'm not going to go into this information because we don't have that much time. So um, I'm going to share my, my presentation and, 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 and I cannot see my, my, okay, one second. It works before, but right now it's not working. It's, it's something very usual when you do online presentations now ah, here i have okay i'm going to concentrate okay. is visible for all of you yeah okay um this is the first one okay to talk i'm going to start with uh, with the main results uh, but before i must i must say that the general objectives of the wind project and, and some of the results were the, the following ones. And as one of the first general objectives was increasing the mutual learning among different European countries and stakeholders and developing transnational common guidelines for trafficked women reintegration. The, we, we believe, the partners, we believe that uh, the results of these two objectives were achieved by mutual learning workshops where partners had the opportunity to learn about the similarities and differences between countries and stakeholders. And we created common methodologies and models to be used by all the partners and design common guidelines for traffic and for the, for the reintegration of trafficked women for sexual exploitation. Regarding the second general or the third general objective in um, improving understanding and knowledge of the trafficking in human beings among the business uh, training and job services providers, trade unions and professional associations. Even if we feel that the objective has been achieved to engage business, uh, businesses, uh, training and job services provi um, providers, trade unions and professional associations in the project was a really difficult task at the very beginning of the project due the uh, due to the COVID-19 health emergency. And uh, regarding uh, one of the most important uh, general objectives, the implementation of personal integration plans for the socioeconomic reintegration of uh, trafficked women for sexual exploitation. And I'm going only to 
Okay, the results are much more extended what is going to be mentioned here because uh, there has been activities as language computer language for computer courses or laboratories uh, organized maybe uh, for the assessment of the skills that haven't been carried out by other partners who are not going to go into this information. And it is important to stress that all partners certify that uh, um, a good comprehension of the project activities has been ensured for all the beneficiaries and to remember the different number of beneficiaries for, all, for everyone. And prob uh, probably there is a mistake here because Bulgaria, you were 26 at the end and I, I, I have included the total amount of the women you seized. Uh, yes, six so, dropped out, six dropped yes. out because of the COVID. Online. Okay. Okay. Taking into account uh, the the information uh, regarding the developing professional skills, all the partners are uh, have identified the an improvement or acquisition of professional skills related to the side jobs by the beneficiaries within the WIN project, and this is very important for us. And when we talk or regarding or or, or in relations to the acquisition and development of, uh, of knowledge of the national labor market and legislation, it is important also to stress that most of the beneficiaries acquire and develop a good knowledge of the national labor market and labor legislation. And we find this objective extremely important and not only limited to a general knowledge, but also to certain issues with a personal impact for the beneficiaries as uh, workers. Uh, and for example, as um, worker rights and union rights, holidays and regulations of the leaves, for example. Um, the partners identify, identify also that most of the women in the case of Spain and Italy and many in the case of Bulgaria develop social networks during the implementation of the WIN project. And it was really interesting to see how important it was for them to build networks for mutual aid. However, uh, it is also important to take into consideration that some of the victims and some of the, of the beneficiaries didn't want to join social networks and only kept uh, fluid contact with the references in the organizations. In relation to the materialization of first internships and formal employment contracts for the beneficiaries in the WIN project, I must say that the objective has been successfully achieved, especially in Italy, where internships have a special relevance, and also in Bulgaria and in Spain. Uh, even of the hard, despite the hardness and extension of the measures adopted by the governments against uh, the widespread of the traffic of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, taking into account the legal and psychological assistance during the project, I must say that the assistance offered to the beneficiaries during the project um, as on, uh, for some of trafficked women in the case of Spain and Bulgaria, and for most of them in the case of Italy, uh, was really, really important. Legal counseling include a broad set of, we offer also legal, legal counseling that include a broad set of issues, not only centered in labor rights, but also administrative issues and the follow-up and, and, present, uh, and presentation of formal complaints against the traffic in rings during the project. Beneficiaries received also psychological counseling as victims of trauma and violence or for improving their self-confidence and autonomy, identification of their skills and resources, recognizing their difficulties and challenges in achieving an effective and sustainable integration. Regarding the lessons learned and recommendations, beyond the differences among uh, the partners due to the specific particularities of trafficking uh, and the prevalence of certain profiles within the borders, uh, and the all singular experience within the project, there are some common lessons and recommendations. I'm just going to mention some of them because there are much more of what I can, uh, what, of what I can explain right now because uh, a question of, uh, for, for, we had a limited time and I'm not able to, to explain all, all, what I've, all, all, the, all the common lessons that maybe, maybe are very interesting for you and you will see in the capitalization document. 
Um, psychological and social support, one of them is that psychological and, and social support should not be underestimated as it is a key part of the integration pro, uh, process. The majority of women we were able to support within the WIM project need intensive social, psychological, and legal support in order to reach sufficient social and emotional stability uh, so they can commit to training, qualification, and job searching. We find that a holistic approach and collaboration between different experts, psychologists, social workers, trainers, employment, employment experts, prove to be efficient when working with women with multiple vulnerabilities. I think this is something common with the, with the Tolerant project. If uh, we, we hear before about uh, uh, talking about this, 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 this scene, the same lesson learned uh, in the Tolerant project. Even if in certain cases, for example, the beneficiaries may have covered those needs through the services provided by the referral organizations, such as it happens in the case of Spain, or administrations, it is very important to take them into consideration in the designing of socioeconomic reintegration projects, as well in budget distribution, distribution and staff efforts. Um, as a second lesson, uh, we find that some third country national victims of traffickers may have a complete educational background or certain educational background in their origin countries, but most of them arrive at their destination country without any certificate. In some countries of origin don't facilitate the obtaining of these documents or have significant difficulties in achieving this. Uh, even if many victims have very poor educational background, uh, this is uh, an issue that we must also take into consideration in socioeconomic reintegration programs in order not to create false expectations or plan the necessary efforts to help the beneficiaries to obtain the documents when designing the project. Um, as a third lesson, I would like to talk about uh, victims. Uh, an issue that we have discovered during the, the during the Win project is that when victims of trafficking are not isolated, their ability to build or to join uh, a network from mutual help is a factor to take into account. Um, as a fourth lesson, uh, the, I, I would like to mention that multi-stakeholders partnership between organizations of the same country, uh, as it was experienced in Italy, seems to be a good practice. At East, it allows the cooperation among different professionals' profiles on every single case to draft, implement, and monitor the integration path, taking into account different aspects and points of you by also offering the women different types of inputs. And this is a really good lesson to be learned that in some cases I've also encouraged some other organizations, as Amiga, for example, uh, to follow the initiative through the signings of agreements with less common stakeholders. And uh, also as a fifth, uh, as a fa fifth uh, lesson learned, the integration into the labor market of uh, women trafficked for sexual purposes requires, requires major effects to be envisaged in, envisaged in the project design to support the women in an active uh, job search. Because to look for a contact to look for and contact companies and to organize and monitor internships, which has proven to be effective to provide access to the labor market. As well to find possible job offers is an activity that consume a great part of the time of the project. Long lasting labor integration of women trafficked requires temporary longer projects. Um, and for us, it was also very important to uh, indicate that only women victims of trafficking from third countries were eligible according to the mid call requirements. But uh, opening this possibility to European and national victims and to vulnerable women, especially at this moment where the socioeconomic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic are emerging, may be very useful. And uh, just at, at last but not at least, uh, we have faced all the problems uh, of, for the COVID-19 a health emergency and facilities for the adaptation and readaptation of the projects uh, that all organizations have made, uh, we, we have we have we have 
readapt the projects during the the developing of the of the pandemic um, is being very important and we find that this possibility is important when we are dealing with trafficked women in general uh, in order to achieve the main goals um, Thank you so much for your attention. And these are the contacts of all the partners. And, and right now I will open the floor for questions and comments. Thank you very much. Is there any question or any comment? Maybe people are already quite exhausted. I think so. <laughs> so much information. Uh, yeah. I think so. Uh, our uh, capitalization paper will be available. So uh, we are going to send it to everyone. And um, so you can read. <laughs> about uh, our work and uh, our conclusions i'm very happy that um, I, in, uh, from the practice we reached the same ideas that the academics and the policy makers <laughs> represented in their speeches <laughs> in the morning valeria sorry uh, nadia if we don't have any comment or any question maybe you can conclude the, the conference, the, the event. Uh, yes, maybe. Thank you for everybody that, uh, for everyone who, uh, that you were uh, together with us uh, to um, be part of uh, the last um, step of our project. Uh, uh, so we were able to share our work uh, with all of you and discuss uh, with them, with you the, uh, some important issues that we found out in uh, um, our work uh, with uh, women victims of uh, trafficking uh, coming from third countries or very vulnerable uh, women. Uh, I hope we will continue in one or another way uh, in the same consortium, uh, either in mutual projects or in referring um, victims to within other organizations and um, discussing uh, topics that we find uh, important uh, and uh, painful and trying to find together answers. Uh, our conference is uh, uh, ending. Uh, as a last request, I would like to ask you to fill in a um, feedback questionnaire, which will be posted in the chat uh, from NIP. Can you please post the link or I, I have to do it? Uh, maybe it will be posted to everyone. You can do it right now, just clicking uh, to the link. Oh, yes, it is already in the chat. You can do it right now and fill it uh, uh, right now while your emotions after the conference are still uh, in your mind. Or uh, you can do it also tomorrow. We are going to send it to everyone who took part in the conference. It is just two minutes. It takes just two minutes to fill in this uh, questionnaire. Okay. Anyone to want that want to say something at the end <laughs> or stay silent? <laughs> yeah. Okay. If not, thank you very much for being part of this event. It was pleasure and honor for us to share our work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia, for coordinating everything. And thank you to all the speaker and all the participants. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you.
and for all the participants too.